Okay, good evening, folks. I'll call the meeting to order. The uh, mayor is out sick tonight, and so I will be uh, chairing tonight's meeting. <coughs> we, uh, we have a brief note about the uh, logistics for the, uh, for the meeting. If anyone has, uh, is participating remotely, uh, please set your first and last name on your, on your screen. So you can do it. Anyone who uh, seeks to address the council, please start by stating your name and where you live. If you have uh, a comment about a specific agenda item, please limit your comments to two minutes and keep them germane. Um, if you wish to speak, you must be called on by the chair. Um, <coughs> and for all comments, uh, Councillor Bate will be helping us by keeping track of the time. Uh, first item on the agenda is to approve the agenda. There is the agenda acceptable to everybody? Yes, Donna, you had an item you wanted to add. Oh, yes, I'm sorry, I was trying to get my agenda up. I'm a little behind. I would like to add a discussion around the Public Safety Authority and its a proposed budget. This just go into the ballot in March. So should that go like under exec under other business or just before other business? Yeah, that'd be fine. It'd be part of other business or right before. That'd be fine. Okay, sounds good. Oh, before we go to executive session, so between nine and ten, maybe. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. That way, whatever happens. Yep. Okay. Any other comments? Yes, Lauren. Um, I request that we um, take items B, the response to allegation of open meeting and ADA uh, violation, and item D, school street closure from the consent agenda um, into the regular agenda to allow for comment. Okay, sounds good. Um, hearing all that, any, if there's no other. Well, you're still approving the agenda. We're still approving yeah. the agenda, yes. Um, uh, hearing no other comments, the agenda is approved. Next item on the agenda is general business and, and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to uh, address the council on any item that is not on tonight's agenda. As always, we ask that you keep your comments to two man minutes in length. And I will start with the people who are in the room who want to be heard, and then we'll go from there to the uh, anyone who's appearing remotely. John. <coughs> Good evening, John Snell, <coughs> First Avenue. First off, I want to thank all of you for running a safe election. It was great. I'm here just to briefly talk about the farmer's market since we just had the last of the summer markets. We ran 26 weekly markets this summer uh, <coughs> with a pool of over 80 vendors. There were um, over a million dollars worth of sales in those markets. Wow. And I'm really proud to say there were also 600 plus SNAP and cop, uh, crop cash transactions that totaled over $23,000. So That's a lot of food for people in need. This one amazed me. We count everybody who comes into the market and we had over 52,000 people attend in yeah. that summer session. It was up 10% from last year. We, uh, prior to that, had had nine bi-weekly winter markets. Who went to a winter market? <laughs> right. <laughs> I, think um, I'm a, I think I did. <laughs> we, we had quite a few people there. We had 42 vendors uh, in the pool and did over $100,000 worth of sales. We only canceled one winter market, and the wind that day was just brutal. We couldn't do it. So that's pretty amazing that we actually had nine of them. I want to thank the state in particular and also DPW and the Montpelier Police Department for really supporting us being at 133 State. There were times when we needed that active support and we had no trouble getting it from all three of them. I am pleased to say that this winter we will be back at Caledonia Spirits. 
This time around, we were there two years ago and it was pretty crowded and tight and COVID weary. This time we're gonna be both inside and outside in the new heated patio. Uh, we already have over 50 vendors who wanna be there. We'll be there the first and third Saturdays of the month, starting in December, running through the end of April from 10 o'clock in the morning to one o'clock. So it'll be really a great uh, offering. And uh, I also just wanted to say that one of the polls we took at the summer market tried to query when you're at the market, do you shop anywhere else in town? 93% of the people who come to our market regularly shop elsewhere in town when they come in for that market. <coughs> so I'm thrilled. That's great news because when I, when when you moved all the way down to the other end of State Street, <laughs> that was my concern, exactly. of course. Yeah, yeah it's That's interesting. To, we didn't query. I don't have the numbers, but we queried, "How did you get there?" And a lot of people are walking. So, yeah. Yeah, when, when you see cars all along State Street, it's just amazing. Yeah. It's a much better location. Yeah. Uh, can we? Can you send us that? I'd love to have that data in electronic <laughs> document for reference. I'd be happy to. Okay. Thank you very much Great. for your support. Thank Thanks, you John. Much. Richard. Richard Shear from Loomis Street. And I'm going to maximize my two minutes by asking you to help me with my address. Uh, I want to talk about guns. And last time I was here addressing you was right after the red flag incident, actually. Um, Bill, could you give us a little history on our charter change vote on um, assault well, weapons? Well, I can, but this is your two minutes, so I don't want to take up oh, your time. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I was asking if I could pause and you could at least inform the people that we did at one time have we a We did at one time have a charter change that would have been uh, the possession of loaded, or the carry of loaded hand firearms, I think it said. And it did pass the voters here and did not get it. Well, it got a couple of leg hearings in committee, but never passed out of committee and never was, there was never a vote taken on it. So it, it was essentially tabled. Yes, by the legislature. Okay. Now, Connor, uh, Burlington, I believe, has passed a resolution asking that their similar ban that was also tabled, I think it was bans in the plural, be reconsidered by the legislature in the next legislature. Is that, am I correct in that? Yeah, it's, uh, it's passed the Board of Health. It's been uh, referred to the Public Safety Committee and the Burlington City Council, I think, will take it off uh, up in the, the next couple of weeks here. My request is because it was tabled and never really adjudged, you know, on the state level, would it be possible for council before the budget hearings began to at least hold Put, put it on the agenda and let's see how the public feels about approaching the state on something that passed, albeit years ago, but, uh, or perhaps putting it on the ballot for town meeting day. That's all I'm asking tonight is that council consider reopening this discussion for the public. Okay, thanks. Simple. <coughs> Steve. Even I know better than that. <laughs> uh, Steve Whitaker, Montpelier. Um, the definite America, uh, America's most mismanaged small town capital. Uh, definition of insanity is doing the same thing over again and expecting a different result. Uh, after repeated warnings that you've got a homelessness task force packed with people who have a conflict of interest the director of a Good Samaritan, the director of Another Way, staff per paid staff for those organizations. Uh, and that same task force has not completed the work that they were assigned to do in the first six months, three and a half years ago. And you just reappointed the same characters for two year terms instead of putting some new blood on there. That's insanity. Uh, I believe you got a consent agenda item to give $40,000 to Good Samaritan for the street outreach. They got five, four, five million dollars from the Housing and Conservation Trust Fund. They can afford their own outreach staff to, to fill out their uh, 
effluent park. We got toilet paper hanging in the trees, that public restroom, that open nature public restroom over there that nobody wants to do anything about. The public restroom committee hasn't met in over a year since they were created. And yet this transit center bathrooms are still closed an hour and a half or two and a half hours during the middle of the day in violation of the lease of our building. So that's been brought to your attention repeatedly. And Frazier's done nothing to enforce the lease with Green Mountain Transit. Um, they fixed the curbs on Rialto Bridge. They curbs are even worse on Langdon Street. Garbage overflowing on the holiday weekends, stacked up two feet above the garbage cans. The garbage contractor selectively choosing which cans to empty or overlooking cans and leaving them, you know, to overflow. Um, restrooms. If you want photos of the human waste piling up in the, in the, you know, toilet paper hanging in the trees, if that'll help you, you know, it's $2 a photo and $2 a minute for my time to get it to you, just like the game you're playing with public records. Later topic on the discussion. Uh, enforcement, quality of life enforcement, the trucks that come through, the diesel trucks especially, but the little hot rods, straight piped, that should be an enforcement priority with the police department. You know, to run around intentionally backfire on your engine or blowing out clouds of black smoke out of your diesel is just, it's toxic, it's, it's a public disturbance. Are you talking about commercial vehicles or just people's no. personal vehicles? People's vehicles designed to make a nuisance out of them. <coughs> so that's my two minutes, I guess. Thank you. President, but I object to the two yeah, minutes President. and I will continue to object mm -hmm. to the two minutes. Yeah. And uh, just to address the restroom committee, I know city staff put on uh, Facebook and front porch forum uh, calls for more applications. Uh, as we discussed the restroom committee a uh, couple meetings ago, the thought was, you know, it goes beyond the issue of um, just the unhoused here. So looking for members from the business community, other folks in the community, and hopefully get, hopefully get that meeting going either late next week or the week after. So okay. just an update. Okay, thanks. Anyone else in person who wants to speak? Okay, online, I see Peter Kelman with his hand up. Uh, uh, thanks, Jack. <clears throat> Peter Kelman, uh, Montpelier, uh, Mountain View Street. Um, I just wanted to uh, congratulate uh, Mayor Watson, who is unfortunately ill, and uh, Connor Casey, a council member, on their election to the uh, state senate and the uh, state house, re respectively. Um, and I would like to uh, urge them individually to very soon announce uh, that they will be leaving their posts and when. Uh, then I hope that the city council, uh, or perhaps just uh, Bill Frazier as the uh, city manager, will um, use whatever uh, communications uh, uh, vehicles are available to explain to the public what the procedures are to fill those positions on an interim basis, if any, um, until a, um, a town meeting day when we can elect replacements. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Mr. Mayor, point of order, would you turn on the closed captions? I cannot hear this audio system and I can't read his lips uh, in this is, is it possible to do that? It would also help if you put one of the microphones near one of the speakers that is serving the laptop. Did, did people in the audience not hear what I said? No, we heard you. Everyone heard you just fine. Thanks. Except Mr. Whitaker. <coughs> That's right. His, everything he says is unintelligible to him, so.
I will just remind everyone in attendance that uh, the rules of procedure require a person to be recognized by the chair before addressing the council. Okay, why don't we, why don't you keep trying to get, get that to, to work and I'll move on with the agenda while we do that. We are on the consent agenda with the exception of items uh, B and D. Uh, is there a motion? I'll move to accept the consent agenda with those changes. I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we've adopted the consent agenda. Now that gets us to item B on the consent agenda, response to, or item B, which was on the consent agenda, response to allegation of open meeting law violation and ADA violation. Uh, do you wanna start us off? Sure. Uh, we received an allegation from Mr. Whitaker, a violation of open meeting law and uh, ADA violation. Um, it was referred to our attorney, uh, Michael Tarrant, who drafted a response and advised that um, I should issue it in order to be timely, and I requested that it be placed on the agenda for council ratification or overruling, if you so choose. Uh, the decision was drafted by Mr. Tarrant, and uh, it speaks for itself. It's written, it was sent to the applicant, uh, the, uh, the person who complained, I'll note that uh, we'll hear more later, but uh, the individual has asked that we send things to attorneys, and we did, and now apparently we have to um, get his approval for which attorney we send them to because the one we sent him to wasn't sufficient. So I would just mention that before he's about to weigh in with that uh, uh, opinion. And could you, you know, for the benefit of the people who are here or are watching, could you hit the high points of what the... Uh, Sure. Uh, so essentially, and it had to do some of it with the closed captioning that you just heard, which is, I th I'm certain, the reason why it was just raised, um, that he alleged that we were, well, I, I'm sure he'll speak for himself, and it's written in the, in the decision, that we had violated the open meeting law and uh, by not providing closed captioning because the open meeting law was connected to ADA, and the ADA required us to have col closed captioning as per an FCC ruling. And the uh, opinion of the attorney was, number one, Mr. Whitaker had no standing to bring this issue because he had not issued any personal complaint or claimed to be uh, harmed or in any way, which, of course, now he's going to allege that he was. Uh, and then secondly, um, that the FCC regulations do not apply to the city anyway, uh, and that because we have closed captioning, uh, for anybody watching on YouTube, uh, that even if we went to the merits, that we were providing that for a person. Um, so presumably we can get, uh, hopefully we can get the closed captioning here, but that's, that's the crux of the issue. And uh, as I said, uh, those, that opinion was drafted for me, uh, by the attorney and using his words. Um, and I just mentioned that because of the, um, pretty personal and untenable email, which is now a public record that Mr. Whitaker sent, uh, claiming that I was being criminal and manipulative and that Jerry's kid had gone to the dark side, referring to attorney Tarrant, so. Okay, thank you. Any comments or questions by any member of the council? Okay, I'll recognize you to make a comment. Well, first of all, open meeting violations need to come to the body, not to the city manager. So your city manager is confusing a public records request on which he is the head of the agency in as if he is entitled to privately consult with a lawyer and resolve this. A public open meeting law violation requires the body to meet within 10 days and address the issue and either make a finding that there is or isn't an issue. But the sloppy logic and the sloppy lawyering that is evidenced in that memo and the issue related to public records, related to being able to come into the place of business and view the videos of the meetings with closed captions and take a copy away, that was ignored entirely. So this is an example of the mismanagement 
uh, of the city and the city's public records, and in this case, an open meeting law violation, which should have brought the whole council together to address, not a fait accompli attempted almost criminally to be passed through on the consent agenda. So I, I can't make excuses for him, but you can hear why this, this is probably a more complex matter for another day. I would suggest that you probably need to, well, I mean, we can take it up again or some of the related surrounding issues at the public records discussion later in the agenda. Um, but I believe I spoke to Kim Cheney about it. He says, I think that the council's gonna need to appoint a committee to do their own fact finding of issues. But the way this was handled and to try to slip it through on a consent agenda without ever meeting to address the issue is was illegal and absurd. If I may. Thank you. Yeah, just to that point, um, the, the open meeting, the, the allegation of open meeting law actually requires no response. In fact, it says if there is no response given within 10 days, it's deemed to be denied. Um, so we could have simply not responded at all and been denied. Um, the our city attorney suggested instead so it was upon his advice that i issued a decision and without the council so that we gave the courtesy of your response and reasoning and i insisted that it be brought to the council for final ratification so that the council could approve it and it wasn't just um, the manager making a final decision so i appreciate there's a difference of opinion but again the law requires no response um, to deny a request Thanks, Bill. Uh, any, any, I don't see anyone else in the room who is seeking to make a comment. Uh, is there anyone uh, participating remotely who is would like to make a comment before we proceed? Okay, is there a motion from anyone on the council? Uh, Donna. I'll make a motion that we deny the violation of the open meeting law. And that's, and ratify the manager's decision? Yes. Uh -huh. Is there a second? Second. Okay, any discussion by members of the council? Mm. Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Um, all opposed? And the uh, motion's passed. Moving on to item D, uh, school streets closure. Kurt, do you wanna give an overview? <coughs> I'm Kurt Modica, Public Works Director. Um, Congratulations, yes, by the way. <laughs> excellent, uh, excellent choice. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm yeah, just briefly just very excited for the opportunity to uh, <laughs> take the reins here. It's a lot of challenges um, uh, for the city and the department. but um, The excitement will wear off. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm up for it. Um, so School Street. Um, School Street has had multiple water leaks over the past few months. We've had um, about five. I believe five repairs on that street um, in the last two months. So uh, my staff has uh, uh, come to me and expressed concern about being able to maintain uh, that water line throughout the winter. Um, when the frost goes in the ground, it tends to further disrupt um, fragile piping. And so we are essentially moving this forward as an emergency water main replacement. Uh, we're looking at about 475 feet of pipe uh, that will address the worst sections of the main where we've made all these repairs. Um, <coughs> Can you say which section that is? Sure, yeah. This is between Main Street and St. Paul Street. Um, we are not going to be in the intersection of either of those streets, so it's a, there's a fire hydrant um, that we're going to use for temporary connection points uh, from, um, you know, between those intersections that we'll be tying into. So uh, traffic will be able to flow uh, around Cedar Street to St. Paul, uh, have reached out to the schools. Um, they're aware and supportive of the work and uh, provided a newsletter to the schools and they've distributed that out to the parents. The drop off for, uh, for kids will be the same, just a different route, won't be able to turn off from Main Street um, to get to the school, to the Union Elementary School, but you will still be able to access from St. Paul and from Cedar down school. Um, so this project, uh, we will, because it kind of came on, uh, because it did come on very quickly, we don't have time to do a formal bid and get this constructed before winter really sets in. Uh, so we have a contractor on Town Hill that's doing a similar project, a water main with the same diameter 
um, pipe and material, so we're proposing a change order to that project in order to expedite the work. Um, School Street will be closed for uh, a month. This, um, we did get a slight delay from the notice I put out. We're, we're planning to now start on Wednesday, uh, November 16th, and it will go, um, the road closure will go through um, you know, mid to end of December, depending on how everything goes. We will do local traffic be able to get in people that have to get yeah. in? Yes, local traffic for residents and businesses will be maintained with some delays. Um, the sidewalks will be open for kids and pedestrians walking to school. Um, and we do plan to open the road up to traffic uh, at night after the workday ends. Um, any any counts, questions from members? Of the yeah, Carrie. Yeah, thank you. Um, so obviously this work needs to be done. I'm glad you're doing it. Um, as a resident of St. Paul Street, <laughs> this <laughs> is going to have a huge impact on our neighborhood. <coughs> and um, especially if the plan for the school pick up and drop off is St. Paul Street, is, is that correct? Uh, so there's three alternate routes. One well, what's, do you know what the school is going to tell people to do? We provided the uh, detour map to the school, and it provided all three routes as options. We didn't dedicate one street. But the pick up and drop off is supposed to be in the same locations. It's just accessing. It's just how they get there. Right, right, right. And so if people are accessing it by coming down St. Paul Street, then instead of School Street, they're going to be lining up on St. Paul Street. And as it is getting in and out of School Street during that pick up and drop off time is sometimes completely impossible, when, especially when there's snow and there's cars parked and everything. So I'm not complaining. <laughs> <laughs> um, it'll be OK. But I did see the letter that of notification that I assume went to people on School Street. Um, I didn't see it in my mailbox. Am I correct that it didn't go to people on St. Paul Street? No, we only did direct yeah. mail notices to school street so residents. So I, I would I would request that this kind of one-on-one -on -one notification go to school street, also Luma Street, because that's going to be highly impacted by the pickup and drop off, mm -hmm. um, and you know at, at the at the minimum I think to let people know because it, it's going to have a huge impact. Yep, yeah, sure we can do that. Yeah. Yep. Okay, thanks. Um, any other questions or comments from members of the council? Was, was this gentleman I here? If there's one person here in the room, why don't you come out up to the microphone? Hello, uh, Steve Stauffer. I'm uh, representing uh, School Street, 28 School Street, the Mangies bread. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much and congratulations. We're happy to have you aboard. And I know it's been a bear on that street for the last couple of months, and let's hope this fixes it. Uh, my main concern and, and uh, concerns of some of the other businesses on School Street is. is not necessarily the access, because I think we can work around that, and that seems to be already in the plan. It's more uh, related to the uh, what it's, it says that will be notified uh, with a notice of 24 hours for planned water shutdowns. Is that a complete shutdown of access to water for anything on School Street for a period of time, or that's? You'll forgive me, but my my uh, uh, I I thought that this was going to be a discussion of the of the uh, council, so I was going to listen and then chime in. So <laughs> thank you very much for for what you've done. But uh, our concern is that if we're you know it just happens to fall into our absolute busiest month of the year, uh, and uh, our concern is that if we have water shutdowns during the day, then we can't operate. And people need rolls. That's, that's <laughs> everybody needs rolls for Thanksgiving, and we're hoping to make them again this year. Uh, so, as far as the the the, the water shutdowns are, are concerned, uh, does that mean complete shutdown to to those buildings and those those residences and businesses on School Street? They should be able to. They should be able to. <laughs> Sorry, just so it could be uh, heard. Um, so we are really minimizing shutdowns by using uh, the fire hydrants as connection points. But there will be at least one time where we have to turn off um, each building to switch the water service over. I think we can work with you. Um, with if it's not freezing, we might be able to provide you temporary water. Right. Um, and, and so I'm happy to talk with you offline so about yeah, how we can do that. Great. I, yeah. I, I realize that it would be uh, an opportunity to chat with you and add to your 
many other things, but yeah, that's something that we can we can discuss because there are uh, other businesses that are concerned about that because they simply can't operate if they're if they have no water, and we we by law have to shut down if we have no water system. So. Great. The worst case it would be one day. Yeah. Um, okay. But I think you know as long as it's not you know twenty below or something crazy like that, let's, you never know. Let's hope for then we can keep water above ground. We could probably uh, okay. make accommodations. Okay. So yeah. we'll talk at. Uh, Thanks. Kurt, while you're up there, um, another question. You're mentioning schools. I just happened to think of this. Um, do you know how school buses will be coming in? Can they make those turns from Cedar uh, or how? Because normally they come down school too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're probably coming down um, from Loomis. We did plan to uh, to block off um, some of the parking near the intersections to improve the turning radiuses for, for the, the buses. For the buses. So we're okay. making accommodations. So for you that. and the um, school have worked out a bus plan. Yeah, I don't know the, all the details, but we did bring that up in our discussions um, with the school, and they're comfortable that they could manage with that okay. with those alternate routes. Thank you. So, will then the school notify you, and you notify residents of where the school buses are if there's a uh, change? Yeah, I, I did confirm with the school today that there is uh, no change for the actual drop-off and pick-up location for the buses themselves. As far as the routes, I don't know all the details about which way they're coming in. Um, but for the parents, that, that won't really change, um, unless maybe that. Yeah, I don't. I don't have the details on the schools. I, I would trust them to make those accommodations. There was another way. time when the school buses had to line up way over on Loomis, mm -hmm. uh, and Liberty actually Liberty got got marked off to help the school bus flow, and it was part of the construction with the playground and everything. And so I just thought there was a lot of public notice that the school bus routes were changing as well as other things and so I just think it'd be helpful for them to know if that's yep. true so maybe we can ask the school to let you let people know sure. that it's not really yours but theirs right okay. yeah I can speak to them about that sure. thanks Kurt I think there's <coughs> so uh, my question is, is uh, could you identify school? yourself please uh, I'm sorry could you identify yourself? Yes, my name is uh, John Boucher, and uh, I own the business at 30 School Street. And my question would be, uh, you, you mentioned about access to the residents, businesses, and so forth. What about service uh, access, such as uh, uh, fuel deliveries, garbage, that kind of stuff? My intention is to actually use the back of our parking lot, go through the church, for the everyday um, in and out sort of quick things. Uh, but I'm a little concerned about the larger deliveries and so forth. Yes, we can make accommodations. Um, okay. Again, I think I'm at the best if I coordinate that with you directly. So you bet. Kind of a meeting, but you yeah, bet. Okay. okay, it's not going to be terrible, and, and just thank you for take tackling the project. It's it's helpful to have that. Right. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. <coughs> Steve Whitaker again. Uh, it, just that first block is probably 20 or 30 of the unmetered spots mm -hmm. where people working in town park their cars all the time. So I would ask that you make some other provision for unmetered some spots in one of the lots somewhere for folks to use for that month. Uh, that's that's a key piece for people who can't go feed a meter every couple hours. Or you're not supposed to do that anyway. Um, but also that is this only going to be paving one stretch underneath the pipe of, you know, two or three feet wide, or is this basically ripping up the whole street? because that section, that first, on both sides of School Street, that first block, the sidewalks are some of the most unsafe in the city. Two and a half inch trip hazards, uh, gaps, et cetera. And if we're contracting out and getting, I'm also concerned with the timing that the asphalt plant is gonna be closed by the time this construction is finished. So we're, we're gonna have dirt and potholes like we've had for the last month uh, till spring. These are issues that weren't addressed in anything that I've read. So parking, sidewalks, paving uh, should be fleshed out here. Thank you. <coughs> uh, happy to address those items, Stephen. Um, so for parking, there, there will not be parking on the street. We did make accommodations uh, in our plan for uh, teachers. Um, 
to park there. Um, as far as the general public parking in those spots, and there's a lot of other unmetered areas throughout the city, but we did not plan to make designated spaces available for those uh, displaced other than the teachers. Um, I did. I should have mentioned that this is really um, phase one of the water replacement on School Street. We don't. It's we're we're going to be into the cold weather um, within a month, and we don't have time to do. Uh, School Street has two water mains to start with. Uh, we're replacing just the worst one, so we're going to have to come back, finish the work in the intersections, switch all the remaining services from the second water main, um, and then abandon that one. So. A lot more work. We don't have enough time to do the full scope. We're really just addressing where the pipe is uh, really failing. So we're not going to pave the whole street because we're going to have more work to do next summer. Um, the asphalt plant, I've heard initially, is going to close this Friday in Berlin. But you can get um, mix out of uh, ha asphalt mix out of Burlington later. Um, and then worst cases, you can get it from you know other states uh, you know almost through most of the winter. So we will just be patching the trench for the water main. We're not going to pave the whole street at this time because there's a lot more work to do. And as I understand it, you're not disturbing the sidewalks at all. No, there's no impact to the sidewalks. Okay, okay thanks. Um, Peter Kelman. Uh, Peter Kelman, Montpelier. Um, I, I, it sounds like there's a lot of information to be um, shared with the public because it's not just the uh, immediate neighborhood, but also uh, all, of the, all the parents of the children who go to uh, the elementary school. This would be a great opportunity to use this new fantastic uh, news, uh, weekly newspaper that's coming out from DPW. It would be a terrific uh, opportunity to explain this to uh, the public on a weekly basis, to explain first what's, what you guys have all talked about here, and there's almost nobody here from the public. Not, not just to send out notices, but sending out notices is important too. So I just wanted to you know, say that the, the new weekly DPW newsletter is fantastic, and I hope that other committees will uh, work, work with Evelyn Prim to do similar kinds of things. This is a great way to let the public know what's going on. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Um, any other comments or discussion before we move to a vote? Okay, is there a motion? Anybody? Donna. Certainly. I'll make the motion that we approve the closure of uh, School Street. Second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? And the motion is passed. Now we move to item six on our agenda, um, outdoor recreation and economic development. Um, here comes Alec. Alec. Here we are. Hi, okay, Alec. Yeah, I think if you have a thumb drive, it's probably the easiest thing. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Alec Ellsworth, and I'm the Parks and Trees Director for the City of Montpelier. And the reason that I'm here is because we have an item on our strategic plan that relates to growing Montpelier's outdoor recreation economy. And uh, we're a year into that plan, and this is um, a status update uh, to talk about what what is the outdoor recreation economy in Montpelier, what have we been doing over the past year, and what uh, lies ahead. 
So it's a quick presentation, oh, probably no more than 15 minutes, and uh, happy to answer questions at the end. Um, um, Alec, just noticing the Zoom is not showing. Yeah, it's, you need to share the screen. So I share yep. screen. Aha. Doing it. Ooh, look at that. Great. <laughs> Miniaturized the picture. Here we go. Perfect. Oh man. You all are pros at this. <laughs> well Beautiful. <done. laughs> Thank you for walking me through that. Um, so because we have a not very, but slightly different counsel from um, when I gave a presentation a, a little more than a year ago. Um, I'm just going to do like a lightning background on what is the outdoor recreation economy in Montpelier so that we're all on the same page. Um, this is a slide, a graphic about some of the ways that outdoor recreation benefits communities. Um, in general, outdoor recreation um, can be differentiated from what people think of as recreation in the sense that um, it's uh, recreation is like organized sports, indoor indoor facilities, and outdoor recreation is hiking, biking, skiing, um, things that are outside. Uh, it's not that complicated. It's as you would expect. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we um, when we think about Montpelier um, and look at this graphic, um, you think about what kind of what kind of city we are. We're not a resort town, a uh, place like Stowe or Killington. Um, we're also not a place that has huge access to public lands like some places in the country or in the state do. Um, but we are, uh, we do have a very vibrant downtown. Um, we are a desirable place to work or a desirable place to live. So the ways that Outdoor Rec benefits Montpelier um, fall a lot into um, really helping the Main Street businesses, um, tourism, attracting businesses, attracting quality employees who want to live in a place like Montpelier, um, and then attracting, you know, new residents of all types, young families, people who want to retire here, um, and keeping people healthy. Um, what is the, the impact of outdoor recreation? This is just a quick slide that shows a few different communities around Vermont that have been studied uh, and the benefits that they're seeing. Um, the, if you look at the column on the right, Kingdom Trails in Eastburg is sort of uh, the flagship mountain bike destination for New England. Um, and this was from 2016, so these numbers I'm sure are, are quite, quite different now and vastly expanded. I'm sure there are well over 100,000 visitors at this point, um, <coughs> seeing significant uh, economic <coughs> gains to that small, small area. Um, taking a closer look at, at them, um, you know, if they have 100,000 people visiting East Burke, and this is the kind of money um, that they're spending, it's, uh, you, can, you can imagine some of the benefits, thinking back on that last slide, that are being distributed pretty widely throughout the community. Um, this is a snapshot of uh, the Matter of a Valley economic impact study about where people spend their money when they're visiting these trail communities. Um, so it's pretty spread between shopping, uh, you know, eating out, uh, bars, lodging, that kind of thing. Uh, and if you think about Montpelier, <laughs> we're really well positioned to capture um, the, you know, these, these dollars that people are spending. Um, we have a lot of things in place because of our vibrant downtown um, that allow us to capitalize on, on people visiting our city for recreation. Um, this is a slide about sort of how we stack up against other communities. Um, I, uh, if you look at the right column, uh, put number one, I put one in the number of years we've been working on this. It certainly doesn't capture all the hard work that's gone in decades of um, developing recreation in Montpelier, but um, we're really just one year into having a sort of focused effort on growing our outdoor recreation economy and creating the, the connections. And I'll talk in just a second about what our strategy is, but. Um, yeah, having a focused strategy is a new, a new thing for us as part of the strategic plan. And I um, want to credit a lot of people who've helped us put that, <laughs> in, put, put that plan in motion. <laughs> Montpelier Alive being a really key player um, and other partners, Trust for Public Land and the state's um, Outdoor Recreation Economic Collaborative um, program has mm. been great as well. Um, I would say we're a few decades behind the communities that were really on the cutting edge of this, the Mad River Valley being, um, you know, the, the marquee place, and then, 
you know, five to ten years behind the people who are kind of riding the wave of outdoor recreation that has been happening not just in Vermont but across the country. I put TBD uh, in number of users because one of the things we've done in the last year is install trail counters throughout our trail system, um, but that we're, we're still coalescing that data into something meaningful and useful to present. So next year's status update, we'll ho hopefully have better numbers there. Um, this is our trail system. Um, this is, uh, I was hoping to have this map for tonight to hand out, but this is just the latest mock-up of our outdoor recreation brochure that's going to be around town and um, in the parks. Um, we have about 20 miles of trails. About half of that is multi-use. Um, and then we have our four and a half mile recreation path that's accessible, as well as a new accessible trail in Montpelier, uh, in Hubbard Park, and uh, a new one coming out at U32. In the winter, we have more. We have about 25 to 30 miles of trails stretching all the way out to East Montpelier um, that are available for Nordic skiing, um, snowshoeing, and hiking. Um, so that was the review section of the presentation. This is the um, what have we been doing section. Uh, these are the three strategies that we are using to try to capture um, the gains of economic development through outdoor recreation. Um, strategy number one is telling the right story. Um, that story is that there are a lot of towns in Vermont with great outdoor recreation. There are a lot of towns in Vermont with great downtowns. There's very few towns that have great downtowns that are seamlessly connected to great outdoor recreation. And that's really the place where Montpelier wants to be. Um, number two is um, thinking strategically about how we invest in our trail system. Um, going back to thinking about the strengths and weaknesses of Montpelier, we, we are not, nor will we ever be, nor probably do people want to be a place like Kingdom Trails um, that has sort of gone all in on mountain biking. We are um, a very family-friendly destination. We have great potential access to rivers and water trails um, and really want to think about that connection to downtown. So when we talk about how we expand our trail system, those are the ways that we're trying to evaluate how we spend our resources. Um, and then number three, thinking regionally. Uh, we're a small city. Um, like I said, we don't have some, uh, some of the same access to public lands as other places, so we have to think about, okay, how can we connect to um, places outside of Montpelier? If we think about how do we connect to Wrightsville Reservoir, how do we work together with Barrie or the other towns in central Vermont? Um, the Cross Vermont Trail goes right through Montpelier, working together with them. Um, we have other big sort of bike trails that go through town. Um, so thinking regionally is number three. Um, this is a uh, chart on the, the next three slides will be the same format. We have our recent projects on the left and projects on deck on the right. Um, strategy number one, telling the right story. We've been really busy on this in the last year. Um, Trust for Public Land and Montpelier Live have been instrumental in doing things like this, uh, this brochure. We have a new brand um, up in the right, uh, which is called All Around Adventure for downtown Montpelier. Basically trying to capitalize on the fact that we have great recreation here, but we're also within 30 minutes of multiple ski destinations and world-class mountain biking and great hiking and swimming. Um, there's a whole new section of their website that's all dedicated to that message. Um, and I have a 90 second teaser that's done if you'll humor me. Will this go through to people if I click on the video? Should. Should yeah. Yeah, it's, it's on the screen. It should. As long as it's on your screen, it should work. Mm -hmm. Oh, maybe I could share my whole screen instead of just the video. I find myself saying almost every day that I feel so lucky to live here. I love having all the amenities of a small city. There's kind of everything you could possibly want. Part of the reason why I moved here, because there's so much green space. I just love being able to walk out my front door and walk for five minutes and be in a park <laughs> or to be on the path. We're really, really fortunate in Montpelier to have accessibility at so many different points to the trails. Oh, yeah. There's a huge variety of trails. 
there's something for everybody. I just love how easy it is to get here to this beautiful place. There's unlimited terrain, so there's plenty of places that you can go and explore on your bike. There's a lot of fun adventures in Montpelier. Anybody can do it, whether you're one year old or 90 years old. All of these trails are publicly available and free to anyone who wants to get out and ski. There's really something for everyone. Look at this, this is like not even five minutes from downtown. You can imagine like you're completely in the wild. Every time I come here, I'm like, pinch me. I can't believe this is right outside of town. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but I was like, wait, I remember this happening. <laughs> Sorry. It's I really like cool. When I talk about outdoor exercise. Yeah, it's really <laughs> weird to watch a video like that get filmed because it looks great now, but it's a lot of rep repetition <laughs> um, when you're doing it. It's so that's cool. that's the 90 second teaser of all the videos that we made. There are eight that are each a few minutes long about different. Um, modes of recreation. Myrna Valeria was our host of all the videos, or all but one, and they would meet at a downtown business. They would talk about what they were gonna do. Myrna would meet sort of an expert in like, let's say mountain biking. They would meet and then they would talk about where they were gonna go and then they would go do the thing and then come back. And so it was uh, great. Uh, Myrna is a really nice person and a wonderful, obviously, for publicity has a, gr a huge reach of people. Um, it's great that she was willing to do that. Um, so yeah, this is some of the some of the stuff we've been up to. Um, we have other projects on deck. We have an adventure guide that we'll be doing next year to go along with this brochure, um, and we have uh, additional videos on tap and um, further promotion through the website. So uh, big credit to Montpelier Alive for taking the taking the horns on that one. Um, let's see how do I? Here we go. Um, so number two, strategic investments. Um, uh, we've had some great success in the past. I expanded the timeline a little bit here to more than just the past year, the past, I would say, three, four years. Um, well, the Hubbard Park expansion, the North Branch Trails initiative that added three and a half miles of bike trail. Um, we've been installing trail counters. We're just getting close to finishing the accessible trail in Hubbard Park. Um, and then I think for me, what I think is one of the most uh, valuable and meaningful programs that we've developed is our Montpelier Youth Conservation Corps, um, which is engaging young people to actually do this work. Um, people, uh, students from MHS and from U32 who are working for us for nine weeks in the summer and, and not just hiring a contractor to do this stuff, but actually getting local kids involved and creating that connection to land that will hopefully um, you know, keep them sticking around. And, and living here and building skills. Um, and as you can see, we've been able to do it uh, with a lot of external funding. Um, we've been successful on that front, uh, getting this stuff done without much cost to the taxpayers, um, at least on that side. Um, <laughs> projects on deck, um, we have uh, Confluence Park, we have um, the River Conservancy, Vermont River Conservancy was able to get a $300,000 grant to study the removal of four dams in Montpelier. We talk about the future of recreation in Montpelier. We really want to be looking toward the water um, as, a, as an untapped resource. Um, so the dams, I think anyone who wants to recreate on the river would agree that the dams are uh, preventing that. Um, unfortunately, you know, there's we need to put a lot of work into studying what's behind the dams and what would be the consequences of dismantling them partially or fully. Um, so that's where that money will go. We have some money to put in a uh, design for a whitewater park as part of Confluence Park uh, in water features. Um, a number of big projects, trail projects that are in design phase right now. And then um, obviously the big one at the bottom, which is the Country Club Road site, um, which is you know to be, to be determined what happens there. Uh, balance of recreation and housing. Um, we also have a number of exciting projects, you know, happening in town in different neighborhoods that could open up um, housing and conservation recreation opportunities. Um, number three, thinking regionally, uh, the Cross Vermont Trail has been busy in town 
building this beautiful bridge that you see in the picture. Um, they are expanding all the way out to East Montpelier and are getting close to their goal of hooking up to the rail trail in Plainfield that would take you all the way to Groton State Forest. So when you can get from Montpelier to Groton State Forest, that will be a, a stunning adventure that I think people will um, want to stay in town and do that um, and, and make that journey and we can have a whole effort around promoting that adventure. Um, we also have had a great uh, program the last few years with Onion River Nordic. Um, that's sort of the theme. It's very partner heavy here, a lot of partners um, on this strategic item. But Onion River Nordic has worked together with our department to expand the Nordic ski trails throughout Montpelier, East Montpelier on the Country Club Road site, former Morse Farm trails, and, and that's been a huge asset to the community. Um, this is the last slide, just looking forward. Um, the you know some of the budget implications of the strategic plan item um, programs on the left the montpelier youth conservation corps has been really effective at getting some of this work done um, as 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 i showed on the slide before we've been really successful at funding it um, externally and um, right below that look we we're putting forward a proposal to have a more of a maintenance type position to um, take care of some of our primary assets you know if we're building confluence park taking care of the recreation path some of the downtown areas montpelier alive wants to chip in some money to um, help water flowers and kind of consolidate some things that a lot of people are maybe doing on the margins of their job but try to do it a little bit better and, and showcase some of the key assets that we have um, and then looking at projects trail building is really you know where the rubber meets the road as far as bringing people to Montpelier and expanding these opportunities. So um, we're putting some, uh, last year we put some capital plan money toward that and um, and um, yeah, that's a, that's a potential item on the list. Um, facing the river, I would just package those together as a confluence park, dam removal on water recreation, um, looking at taking um, opportunities there. And then the Country Club Road site. So um, all these things are going into the sausage grinder of the uh, budget. Um, you know, as far as what, what comes out in the staff recommendation is still TBD. <laughs> and as you all heard, it's a challenging budget year. But um, this is, you know, basically laying it out as far as um, advancing the strategic goal, some of the, some of the ways we would put money in. And um, as you saw before, we've, we've, been, we've been successful at leveraging the funding that we put in with external sources too. So that's the end of the presentation. Um, and there are any questions? <laughs> Jennifer. <laughs> oh, that's great, Alec. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions from members of the council? Yeah. <laughs> um, th that was awesome. Thank you. Um, I'm a big outdoor person, love to camp in the winter kind of person. Yes. And I am wondering if that map is going to differentiate which trails are good for summer, which ones are good for mud season, which ones are good for winter. So this is a non-winter map. Non-winter map. Non is there map. a winter um, map There's somewhere? a winter map in maybe development down the road. Got it. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it would be like the adventure guide is next, and okay. in the queue behind it would be a This is a map. snowshoe, right? I but yeah. only know of a couple places, so I was like, ooh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's all I wanted to know. Thank you. Donna? Uh, I just want to really appreciate just you've taken on the, the parks, and you've just grown from where Jeffrey was, so I really appreciate Thank that you. you've been very successful. Keep it up. Thanks. Thank you for this really thorough presentation. As one of the people who is not on city council before, I really appreciate being, you know, get a little, little catch up <laughs> that you provided. So that's good. Um, so I, um, I this is this may not be for you to answer. I think this is probably a bigger strategic question. But as we're thinking about uh, the the outdoor recreation economy, and we're thinking about it in financial terms, and we're thinking about the financial gains that Montpelier can see from outdoor recreation. Um, I'm I'm interested in more detailed concrete information about how that actually happens and um, because I can imagine when I look at the at the videos which are amazing by the way incredible beautiful videos um, but if we have wealthy people from out of state coming 
and riding their bikes and going home, and maybe they spend their money on um, hotels and restaurants. Um, is that I want I want to understand better how that is an economic benefit to the entire community. So the people who are not the business owners, the people who don't own the restaurant and don't own the hotel, um, and the people whose property taxes may be going up because their property values are going up because maybe more people are coming in. And so, um, so I'm maybe being a little, I'm, I'm sounding cynical, I'm not trying to be cynical, <laughs> but I'm trying to, um, to understand a little bit better how this can actually benefit, um, or you know, how it will benefit the kind of regular everyday people who are living in Montpelier, you know, not the ones who own the restaurants. And, um, and we have to be careful about becoming uh, an attraction for people to move here who bring lots of money from out of state and can pay lots of money for their housing, which drives the prices up. And obviously that's already happening. We're, we're seeing that happen and that's not, um, that's making it harder for some people to live in Montpelier, easier for other people to live in Montpelier. So, so it's not really a question for you, I know, because you're not the economist <laughs> yeah, behind no, this. I, mean, I, can, I, <laughs> I just can, wanted uh, to voice that. I can that. say a little bit about it because I think it's a really good point. Um, and I'm glad you brought it up. I think that when we look about, talk about our next steps, especially that item number one, you know, telling the right story, um, I think we need more community input around that story. Um, we need a lot more, more public process around it. I think we have developed the story with, you know, our staff and Montpelier Alive and input from nonprofits and um, taking examples of other communities, but I think that the, the residents of Montpelier really should weigh in there. Um, and we, we're hoping to be part of a federal program called Recreation Economy for Rural Communities um, mm -hmm. that does exactly that. They basically give you money to engage in a planning process with the community to talk about what outdoor recreation looks like, um, what kind of economic development people want to see. Um, they have paused the program, so um, we're you know keeping keeping an eye on it. But I think the point you make speaks exactly to that, which is that yeah, more public input and keep pulling the thread on the sweater to talk about you know what what is this for and why. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, it's a great question, and, and some of it you answered before. And one thing you didn't talk about, at least I missed it, were the fat bikes uh, and the, all the new trails for the fat bikes. There was a lot of data about people coming into a community and doing the trails, and that they tend to stay two or three days, unlike the leaf peepers that come in on buses and just leave. And so I thought some of that data came from you, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's great data from other communities about how people spend their money when they come to a town to do outdoor recreation. Um, and I think probably a lot of it, I, I presented that, some of that in the longer, in the longer, me in the longer presentation last year. Um, and some of it would probably hold true for Montpelier, but I think ultimately, um, unless we do our own economic impact study, we won't know what, what the impact is on town. Until well, we do and the group that the Regional Planning Commission was sponsoring and, and meeting, I know I, I attended a couple of the remote meetings yeah. with the statewide uh, recreational trails and how to promote them. Mm -hmm. Is that still going on? Is that an ongoing? Yeah, yeah. So there's two, there's, there's two programs. There's a statewide program called VORec, which stands for Vermont Outdoor Recreation Economic Collaborative. VORec is a lot easier to say than the full name. Um, and they're focusing on <coughs> helping communities capitalize on economic development through outdoor recreation. And one of, one of our new programs that we got with VOREC funding was a, a regional, quarterly regional meetings in central Vermont. Um, so outdoor recreation stakeholders, um, not just people like me, but people like, you know, Main Street businesses and um, people who have more of a traditional economic development role getting together and talking about what's our strategy for central Vermont, you know, how are we working together? Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, and I don't see any hands raised uh, online. So, Alec, thanks a lot. I think this is great. This, the vision is really, uh, you can see how this can build in the, into the years into the future. Yeah, thanks for having me. I think he's going very far. No. <laughs> Get a different presentation out. Uh, our next item on the agenda, item seven, Emerald Ash Borer update. Uh, John, is that you? All right. <laughs>
already warmed up. Mm -hmm. I was <laughs> I was predicting the other John uh, tonight, but <laughs> he couldn't make it. He wouldn't. He wouldn't okay. <laughs> Ready when you are. Is there, do you have a presentation for this? Oh, you do. In my capacity in this presentation is as chairman of the tree board. We work very closely with parks and trees. Uh, yep, yeah, I'm still Alec Ellsworth. Um, <laughs> for those of you who have no idea, which I'm sure is everybody, um, what the Parks and Trees Department is, we are about 65, 35 uh, parks and trees. So. Um, the park side, I think, is pretty obvious. The tree side is um, the simplest way to explain it is if you go about 25 feet in either direction from the center line of most roads in town, um, all the trees within that corridor are maintained by the city. So our, our small staff um, does the maintenance, pruning, removals, planting within that area. And the tree board is an instrumental um, community uh, board that, that basically assists with that work. Um, so yeah, getting back to the to the why we are here, um, we adopted an Emerald Ash Borer Management Plan in 2018, um, and this is an update on where we're at with that plan and what uh, the next few years hold um, and where the needs are. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about you know the past few years of, of EAB and and the status and what we've been doing as part of the plan and then what we plan to do moving forward. Um, so uh, emerald ash borer, small insect that infects all ash trees, um, it was first found in Vermont in Orange in 2018. Um, it was estimated at that time by people who are experts in the field that it had been there for six to nine years. Um, it was found shortly thereafter at National Life in Montpelier. Um, and because it wasn't found in a forest setting, um, it was just found in a tree in the parking lot. Um, it was not clear at that time what what state, you know, if, if it had been if it had been the only one, or if it had been three years, or five years, nine years. Um, so um, at this point, because we have a few years, you know, it's been five years since 2018, and we've been monitoring it closely. We're guessing that we're in year six to seven of the infestation. Um, and that's great news, <laughs> you know, it doesn't seem like it. If we had been in year six to seven in 2018, I think we'd be in a much worse um, state right now. And the, I guess the teaser for, for this whole presentation is like, um, we, we had a plan, we've been following the plan, and I think we're in pretty good shape with that plan, so we, we should celebrate that we did that. <laughs> the council, the staff, um, I, I feel like too often we sort of gloss over when we actually do that type of thing. So uh, appreciations all around for that. Um, but yeah, at this point, we're, we're likely in year six to seven of that infestation. And if you look at the graph on the right, it's a little blurry. Apologize for that. Um, but the line shows the percentage of ash trees that are dead. And um, the, the numbers on the bottom are the years from the beginning of the infestation. So we're at uh, about the red arrow there. So you can see things are start, starting to get quite bad or, or will be quite bad here in the next couple years. We might not be seeing widespread ash death in the next summer or two, but yeah, by, uh, by 25, 26, 27, people will look around at the ash trees all over town and they will all be, all be dying um, or dead. This is not new news either. We, we were first appeared here in uh, 2016 with a preparedness plan and John Akalisiak did a great job of, of doing that and that plan was utilized throughout the state by other communities. Uh, but it showed exactly this curve where once you hit, you know, about year eight, uh, it takes off like a rocket ship and there, these trees will die, period. They will die unless they're treated, which Alec will talk about in a moment. Um, so this is the status of the ash trees in Montpelier. Um, we have 743. Um, I'm sure that's not perfect, but <laughs> it's probably pretty close. 
number. Um, thanks to the good work of the tree board and staff who do a survey of the ash trees every year, um, either in the right of way or close to it, um, you know, could, could impact the public. Um, they're widely distributed. You see they're the gray dots all, all on the map there. Um, they're roughly 8% of the street trees that we have. So it's a good, uh, really uh, significant chunk of the urban forest. Um, most significantly, uh, if you look downtown, every single large tree downtown is a green ash tree, um, literally every single one. Uh, there's not a tree over 20 feet that is a different type of tree, so. Uh -oh. And those green ash were all planted about 50 years ago. So they've, they've been there a long time and we hope to keep them long enough so that we can replace them. Um, yeah, so they're, they're a really important part of our downtown streetscape, uh, underappreciated, but important. Um, John has taken some amazing photos with the heat gun that show like on what the, what the temperature of the sidewalk is on a 90 degree day and what the temperature is in a bench under an ash tree on the corner of East State Street and Main Street. Um, it's pretty amazing. Um, so um, this is what we have done. Um, oh, uh, sorry, going back to this, the red dots are, w uh, we had a major windfall in our plan, which it wasn't in the plan, but it was uh, wonderful that it happened, which is Green Mountain Power. Montpelier was at the top of their list of places that they were removing ash trees. So they came in a few years ago and removed 200 ash trees about all over town. Those are the red dots. Um, Anything that would impact the lines, they did. We paid for it, you know, penny by penny. But uh, it was a huge boon, boon to us. It re yeah, I really, I, I shudder to think where we would be without that work because they, they did take a lot of um, high-profile trees. Yeah. Um, so all of these items track back to the Emerald Ash Borer Management Plan. Um, we're treating prominent street, te street trees. That keeps them alive as long as we treat them every two to three years uh, with a trunk injection. Um, we're removing 10% of the ash in the right of way every year. Uh, we've removed 77 up to this point um, and plan to continue that work or accelerate it. Um, we are planting new trees downtown to replace the large green ash, um, and we're using a new, um, well, it's not new, but a new to Montpelier um, innovative technique to try to have the trees grow bigger and last longer, um, mostly to do with replacing a bigger um, root area underneath the sidewalk uh, that mostly goes unseen to everyone but the tree. Um, so the tree has a much bigger area to grow, and getting it more water. Um, we uh, have invested in staff capacity um, through our Parks and Trees program, specifically in the City Arborist position um, that really spearheads a lot of this work. Um, and we have an annual monitoring program. We have a number of slow the spread techniques, um, including a marshalling area for firewood, uh, for ash firewood, and a, a way of something we call trap trees, where we, we treat, we actually girdle trees that are infested and then treat them with the insecticide so that um, bugs are attracted to them and then get killed by the insecticide. Um, and then we uh, have created, or um, we create added value products. There's a, obviously a sort of a windfall of ash, which is a very valuable wood for a var variety of things. It's great firewood. It's uh, beautiful wood for um, hardwood boards. So we uh, got a grant to purchase a mill um, with some matching funds from the city that um, We'll be, we'll be using to mill some of the urban ash um, and sell. Um, and then, yeah, the Green Mountain Power program as well. Um, these are the people that are doing the work. Um, Adam McCullough, some of you may know him, uh, is our city arborist. Uh, there's me, uh, John, and John Akalashik, who uh, gets a lot of credit for all this. Um, I, yeah, sing his praises. He actually won an award on a state level for his work in Montpelier on ash, uh, on EAB. He won an award from the Vermont Urban and Community Forestry Program for, I don't know what the t name of it was, but it was like awesome <laughs> community member. <laughs> and he deserved it, he is amazing. Um, Joanne Garten, who lives in town sh and works for the Vermont Urban and Community Forestry Program has been instrumental uh, in advising us. And then our parks and tree staff who do the work um, of actually removing these trees and treating them. 
uh, and many, many tree board volunteers. Anyone you want to add? <laughs> There's more people, but that's a, no, yeah. Um, so this is uh, where things stand. Um, we, if you look at the plan, we've basically accomplished everything except for two things. Um, one is um, upgrading our bucket truck to uh, one that's more suited for urban forestry. And um, the other one is discuss discussing, and that would be a council discussion about a revolving loan fund to help um, private resident residents with trees on private land. Um, so, you know, let's say somebody has a tree on private land that could fall into the public right away, um, but they don't have the resources to deal with that. You know, what what do we do there? So that's a that's a conversation for further down the road after we've dealt with our own problem of the trees in the right of way and we really want to be dealing with those as soon as we possibly can um, and one of the things that's important to know is that the, the, the longer you wait during the infestation the more dangerous these trees are to um, deal with they become very brittle and unpredictable um, there's been a lot of injuries and fatalities in the arborist injury in the arborist industry related to EAB because um, you might you might do something that um, you've done a thousand times on another tree, and when a tree is infested with emerald ash borer, it just doesn't behave in the same way. So uh, much bigger branches are failing, trees going in unexpected ways. So uh, once a tree is fully um, infested and dead, your options for removal are, are incredibly limited. You know, crane removal, um, dropping it from the ground if you, if you have clearance, which we often don't. So it gets expensive quickly. Um, that's why we're trying to accelerate our program as quickly as possible now. Um, so those items, again, just like the last presentation, you know, we're, it, it's all seeing the light of day in the budget process and um, see, see how it comes through. Um, that's all to be determined. And then... Um, Sorry, it seems like the audio stopped going through Zoom and we are not sure why. Okay, Yeah. Well, except we've got the audio that needs okay. to be addressed. So that's a good time for a break. Okay, it's a, it's a little early. Why don't we take our 10 minute break? And hopefully by the so is it time for us to ask questions? All right, let's start up again. Um, Donna. I did give Alex and John a, a chance to think about this since we had a break, but I was curious as to how long we can treat the trees and whether we have enough in the budget to maintain those trees that we've decided to treat and what they need for us to keep up with the trees as they talked about the increased volume. Uh, yeah, we can treat the trees in perpetuity, in theory, uh, every three years. Uh, we don't really know what's going to happen, but <coughs> the, the, what it's going to do besides buy us time to plant more trees mm -hmm. is a chance to perhaps come up with some resistant trees to uh, have insects that are predators to the emerald ash borer mm -hmm. brought in, a little wasp. Those are already being released in some areas. We don't know whether they're sustainable or not. But if we can keep them going, the main benefit is that um, we, can, we can grow the other trees around them on the street. And we've seen, uh, we've seen the trees that we planted there really taken off. So that's, that's good. Yeah, and just to answer your question about resources, it was a, there was an expense to tooling up to getting the right equipment to treat those trees and the right training. Um, but at this point, you know, uh, like a very modest increase to our operating budget would cover the, the, the new program of treating these trees. So 
it's basically a matter of buying the product and we have most of the expensive items now and the people to do it so yeah I feel I feel good about maintaining the treatment program at a very modest cost okay. yeah. thank you thank you yeah Connor yeah thanks so much guys it, uh, you know, it feels good to like uh, you came in here years ago like just with this proactive approach and you know it's not great but it's under control <laughs> anyways what are, other, what are other communities doing? Um, are, are they in a similar spot? Are they taking the same steps? Is it, mm -hmm. it going to be a wasteland like if you go out of town here? Um, there's, a, there's a pretty wide range of response throughout Vermont, um, but I think it's consistent in the communities like Montpelier, like if you look at Rutland or Brattleboro, um, South Burlington, they're taking a similar approach of, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, using the resources they have, being creative, not trying to go too crazy, like, you know, not cut all the ash trees down at one time or treat all of them. I think people, uh, credit to the state urban and community forestry program, you know, they, they've advised all the cities and towns on what to do, and I think they've been very skilled at doing that. So people are taking this very balanced approach. I think Montpelier, we were ahead of the curve in the sense that we had John and John to develop this plan and come to you, people who had the, the foresight to do it. Um, so I, I think we're in better shape than some communities. And then there's all the rural communities that are kind of just letting their trees die and fall yeah. where they may, which is not great, but they're not left with a lot of options. If you're East Montpelier and you have 20,000 ash trees along your road and a couple, you know, a <laughs> couple people who do all, all the road work, not to say nothing of the tree work, it's an insurmountable problem. We, we had a lot of good examples from the Midwest where all this started in Michigan in 2002. Uh, and I grew up in Michigan and get back there once or twice a year, so I got to see this happen. And you'd see communities where they did nothing because they didn't know what, what it was all about. And literally, five to 10 years later, every single ash tree was dead and they were falling on houses in the street, in the woods. It was jack straw pile. Um, other b then at some point people thought, well, let's cut them all down preemptively. And it turned out that was a mistake because the, the emerald ash borer would then jump further to the next available ash tree. You'd cut down all of the easy ones. They only travel about two to three miles a year on their own. It was, of course, <coughs> we found out, moving firewood that was the big transporter mm -hmm. that caused them in 20 years to reach all the way to here to Vermont and across the Mississippi River. And um, so we learned a lot from other communities early on. And John, uh, John A. just managed to grab all that and put it in a, a doable format. Thanks so much, guys. I just want to remember, remind the council and the community, when you came to us, it was not a unanimous vote to put money aside because it wasn't visible. It was, it was gambling on a future that we were committed in a preventative mode. And so I just really appreciate that happen, but it also, it's a challenge for the council that we do have to think ahead. And, and whether it's saving land or it's proactive on a disease that's coming in on our trees. So I, I, I remember that fight. <laughs> Those first $10,000 was hard. <laughs> you know, yeah, Lauren. Yeah, I was having a similar thought as Donna. I remember having the conversation during the pandemic and the budget was so hard and we're like, oh, do we keep putting the money in? And I think just like the the foresight and planning and the consistent, modest investment to keep us where we are and like really appreciate we're on top of it. And I'm sure we'll have similar discussions with a broader budget and just, you know, having to look ahead and make strategic investments now that might still be hard, but are gonna save us money in the long run and save huge problems from coming down the road. So thank you for the foresight and um, really keeping us on top of this. I, I want to observe, you know, like, like everyone else, it's, it's great that we did this and got ahead of it. And I think that this is really a testament, testimony to the uh, quality and the qualifications of the volunteers around the city who have volunteered to be on the tree board and many of the other uh, volunteer boards and commissions that we have. And not every city has that resource that they can do. I think this is just great. Um, I have... Uh, before the leaves started falling, I, I went around and looked at at least 
one or two of the trees, uh, new trees on Main Street, and they look like they're uh, really quite healthy and thriving. Is that uh, what you found? Yeah, I mean, it's a little early to tell, in my opinion. <laughs> you know, it's like what the saying is like the first year they sleep, the second year they creep, and the third year they leap. So <laughs> we're in the first year. Uh, <laughs> uh, but they're alive, I'll say that much, you know. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, if they're leaping in three years, then uh, I'll be really happy, but I'm cautiously optimistic. Well, and, and that's the four that we planted last year in this, this yeah, new, yeah. new way. Prior to that, we, we worked really closely with uh, DPW to, you may have remember we tore up a bunch of sidewalks <laughs> and uh, threw all this gravelly looking stuff in the holes and then poured new sidewalks. And everybody's saying, what'd you do that for? Well it gave a bigger root zone to, we left the existing trees there and those trees have taken off. We were losing trees after about five or six years. These trees now are continuing to grow in a way that I w I'm just thrilled about. Okay, anybody else, anyone on, online have any uh, questions you'd like to uh, raise? Okay, thanks, thanks for coming so in. Thank you. Thanks, thanks. Thank you. All right, we are up to item eight, uh, the tax in instrument financing and tax stabilization. Um, yes, that's correct, Mr. Council President. And Stephanie Clark from White and Burke, our TIF consultant, will be joining us, is joining us remotely. Um, while, while she's setting up, I did want to just report out that um, we did we have looked at the closed captioning, and it does appear that it's possible. We believe it would require a full shutdown and restart of the whole meeting to do it. So we're suggesting we will do it for start it for next meeting after we can test it and make sure it's working. But we can try it tonight if you would like us to. We can't guarantee it'll work, but we think it will. I would prefer to keep going forward tonight and. I just want to let you know that we are yeah. on it. Okay. With that? Uh, with that, um, I will say, just in, by way of introduction, we had listed in our strategic plan to look at our TIF and tax stabilization program and um, been wanting to get to this. Uh, with the TIF program, we're running up onto some deadlines with the state, so it was um, very timely that we be taking a review at um, kind of what we wanted to do with it because we have to make some decisions. And so I think I'm going to leave it to Stephanie to kind of lay out where we're at with the, the rules and regulations of TIF and the decision points we're at and what we're recommending and why. And then um, once we finish the TIF conversation, and there's really, we don't really have anything specific on tax stabilization, but I can explain why that's, how they relate. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Stephanie. I think most of you have seen her also in her roles with the uh, CCR project, Country Club Road project? Yes. So. Yes, thank you, Bill. Um, hello, counselors. Um, and good to see you again in this capacity. Again, I'm Stephanie Clark with White and Burke Real Estate Advisors, and we helped put together the original TIF district in 2018. And so you've seen the memo, but I'm going to do a quick recap just for anyone who um, is listening that didn't get or didn't see the memo, but the original district was established in 2018. It identified 11 private development projects that could be stimulated by the investment of the city into seven public infrastructure projects. That was a, a grand plan, which is what that exercise is and sets out as a goal. And then there was a pandemic. So things changed. A lot of things changed. Um, some of the projects were abandoned. Some of the projects changed course, some of the projects ended up getting done, but on a different path. And we're finding ourselves in a totally new era, um, even just five years later, not even. And part of that is the construction cost environment. Part of that are the market conditions. Uh, part of that is population change and population demand. And the city has been exploring, as you well know, different economic development options and different um, economic development opportunities, not, not least of which is the Country Club Road site. And so the question uh, came back to, to us as the fees, looking at feasibility is, is the district as you have it set up today serving the purposes that the current city of Montpelier has for its economic development goals? And the answer was no. And 
the point of the tool is to set it up and use it prudently. If you don't use it, there's no penalty, there's no damage done. In fact, it's a really good sign when a district can um, acknowledge and own that it's not the right tool to be using for these projects. It's not irresponsibly spending or investing poorly. It's making the choice not to use the tool, and in this case, dissolving the district as it stands today. So there's no penalty to dissolve it. There has been no debt incurred. There's been no infrastructure projects done to date. So the district will, um, we spoke with BEPC with the Vermont Economic Progress Council, which is the state entity that oversees the TIF district. They understood uh, our position. They've approved of this process, which would be that we dissolve the district, you dissolve the district um, with authorizing a letter to the state and then you no longer have a TIF district, but it doesn't preclude you from applying in the future should there be a need for a district in another iteration. You know, it could be a different location, it could be a different um, organization of it, and it, it will undoubtedly have different priorities and different projects in its uh, sites. So you can apply again in the future. There is a limit to two districts per county. Um, and so this would this would not count against that limit the one you had already it would go away so there would still be opportunities for two barry has a tiff district but that came before the rule um so two districts left could happen in washington in washington county and if the city wanted to reapply it would be one of those two if that makes sense just that the district you have goes away. It doesn't take up a slot unnecessarily. Um, yeah, as Bill mentioned, we have the one of the reasons this is coming up right now is that there is a there was a rule and part of the existing TIF district is that you had to incur debt before five years, um, before the end of five within your first first five years, and that date date is March 2023. And you're not going to incur debt on any project before March 2023. And again, it doesn't isn't consistent with the goals. So this is a good time to dissolve the district and reassess the economic development options. So my recommendation is um, if you take a vote tonight to sign the letter, I will then submit that to BEPSI with the minutes of the meeting. And uh, that will officially dissolve this district in its current form. If I may just add a couple things to that. Um, so in addition to the, the debt deadline, um, there's also a total lifespan of the, the TIF district of the, the 20 years. So even if we were to incur debt in March, we'd only have sort of 15 years to, to do that. So if we were to, basically if we start up a new district, we start at the beginning and we have the full 20 years to, to work with and the debt period. And, and as Stephanie said, you know, we could conceivably um, reconfigure the district so for example it does not include the country club road site currently and goes all the way down uh, you know through downtown it's this big long district so we might want to think about that the other thing i would urge um, particularly the two members of the council who are going to be working down the road next year is there's actually a proposal for what's called project-based tiff which rather than having large tiff districts um, you actually have you set up a TIF specifically for a project, and ideally those would not be limited to the number per town, so it would be a, a self-sustaining type project. And uh, we're really, actually, we in the city are really in favor of those, and there's been some pushback from the legislature. I know the, the community development folks at the state are also going to try to push it again this year. So we're counting on at least two votes <laughs> in, in favor of this. <laughs> Donna. I like the attitude, Connor. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't think there's any question about this, so I'm going to make a motion uh, that we formally dissolve the city's TIF district uh, with the option of reapplying re in the future, and then we authorize the mayor and the city manager to send a letter to the Vermont Economic Program Council, formally dissolving. I'll second. All right. I, I do want to have some discussion because I have a few questions, but I, I think you're right. It's a pretty easy call to make. Uh, but Stephanie, I have a couple of questions. Um, it's it's hard to see what uh, the downside might be for for taking this action, but I can imagine that uh, one potential risk is that uh, we might miss the queue because there could be two other municipalities within uh, the county who are 
if we want to jump in front of us and get uh, TIF districts approved, and you know, I, I don't want to get you to do anything that would that you would feel is unethical, but but you could conceivably be uh, be developing a, a plan for another town just the way uh, you worked on it for us. Um, is there any way of knowing if other municipalities in the county are? You're very wise, Councillor. Yeah, <laughs> about that's, to um, file. That, that, that is a that is a risk. So that is a risk. You're right to put that um, forward. Is a risk um, as those slots could get eaten up before before you come back. That being said, I know of no other district, no other community in Washington County that is seeking um, a TIF district, at least not through my firm. Um, and we do the majority of the TIF work in the state of Vermont. Um, and, you know, I think that would be, VEPSI is very open about districts that are pursuing TIF. So it's a matter of staying in close contact too, I think is a good idea um, to just stay in touch and talk about economic development initiatives with them frequently anyway. And therefore, you know, staying on top of the idea that, you know, if there's other communities that are looking to do TIF, and maybe in that case too, it's just, understanding what other tools like bill had said a pro you know project-based tiff might be the better fit anyway um so just something to keep in mind thanks i remember when you came to us a few years ago and made the presentation about doing the uh, tiff district you were very clear that we shouldn't just go and figure well, what the hell we'll do this and then hopefully mm -hmm. something will happen we'll have it it only makes sense to do it if we have uh, mm -hmm. projects that uh, that we already think might uh, might benefit the city. Uh, Absolutely, and and to that end, you know, I'll just give you an example real quick, which is that uh, Montpelier and Bennington were both approved at the same in the same time frame. Bennington also did not incur debt within its first five year window, and they recently went back to get approval to get an extension for another five years to be able to do the incurring of debt for the next five years and that was a strategic choice because they had they have projects that are at the ready right now that are trying to use the tool and they they were so close and they said we just need to be able to keep our district and it's exactly still the projects that we had on that list are still moving forward mm -hmm. so for them it made sense and i think this is a wonderful example of the tool being able to be um customized to each in each municipality using it prudently for your community one other I, I see that there's a hand uh, just to add to, to the question of, of risk i guess you know in addition to the two per county there's a statewide limit and i think there's four or five i think if we if we were to give this up i think it becomes five open tiff slots statewide so it's also possible that five other communities elsewhere in the state not in washington county could take those but again we have talked to vepsi and they're not aware of any that are in active yeah, discussion anywhere okay. um so you know we, even if one were to come in there would still be four left but just so you're aware thanks were you raising your hand Le lauren uh, Linda Burke. I just yeah, want to say, I mean, part of the reason I guess I felt so firm about going ahead and dissolving it was we only have three months until it'll be officially dissolved anyways. So I'd just try to do it now and be clean mm -hmm. about it. Because we want to have projects in the pipeline. And right now, none of them are in the district that we had proposed. So I yep. think we need to do a major restructuring of any future one. Uh, Linda Berger. Thank you. I just had a question. I, I thought I understood Stephanie to say that um, this didn't match the current economic development goals of the city. So does that just mean the goals that were in the specific TIF district? Yes, our TIF district plan at the time, you know, was prioritizing the downtown parking garage, for example, and, and those priorities, which um, just aren't consistent at the time right now. Thanks. Okay, any other discussion? All right, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. Thanks, Stephanie. You're welcome. Take good care. Thanks, you Stephanie. Too. Okay, we're up to item nine, uh, discussion or presentation of uh, our history of public record requests. 
I assume that's to you, Bill? Yeah, uh, well, it's not to me. This was requested uh, under our charter, uh, which allows any resident or person, actually, to request an item be placed on the agenda, and Mr. Whitaker did so. So I will turn that over to the agenda requester. <coughs> okay, you're up. <coughs> Can you hear me? No. Um, no? Not quite. Yeah. Get, get closer to the mic, I think. Is, uh, is yeah. this one not turned on? That's better. So there's four, cate four uh, categories or issues that need to be discussed here. There's timeliness of records. There's fees. There's access to inspection and copies. And then there's transitional systems. Um, timeliness, I saw a list here at the table for the first time tonight, uh, print so small it can barely be read, but it's a list of a bunch, a couple of years worth of public records requests, not just from me, but from many people in the community. Um, and it doesn't include some of the longest outstanding requests that have still not been completed. The permit conditions on city center N numerous a number uh, a small number of people that I've spoken to recall when city center was permitted that those restrooms would remain available to the public this this is on uh, same with the parking garage would be publicly accessible uh, at city center uh, apparently those permit conditions uh, have disappeared from the file misplaced, intentionally misfiled, whatever. But uh, numerous requests, appeal to the head of the agency, et cetera. The city manager has yet to certify that the records don't exist, which tells me that there's somebody's doing a favor to a developer or suggests that somebody's doing a favor by disappearing a permit condition that, that has people shitting on the streets, okay? It's unhealthy, it's, it's unethical, there's a whole th lot of things wrong with it. But the failure to certify the non-existence of the records should be a telltale sign. Uh, the, the spreadsheets, the Motorola spreadsheets, I asked recently for records that were used in the application for public safety grants. Uh, I asked for the spreadsheets that became the basis for the quoted prices that went into the grant application. I was given one spreadsheet, but when you hover over many of the numbers on one of the four tabs, it references another spreadsheet. And management basically said, that's all we got, tough. It's like, yeah, but they had the numbers, either on another spreadsheet in the same folder or through a web access to a vendor spreadsheet. They had the numbers in order to put them into the proposal, but they did not comply with the records request for the spreadsheets that are the basis for that application. Uh, and they didn't really give a shit a, uh, a damn about following through and complying with the law on that. Um, the body camps proposal. I was told by one of the regional lead regional salespeople from Axon, which is the market leader, which Berlin has a purpose-built body cam, that they had provided a proposal to Montpelier. This is not the only records that are disappearing, you know? So the body cam proposal they claim isn't here. They were, the reason it might not be here, somebody threw it away because it also included a proposal for tasers and this town has, council has voted not to have tasers. but. The fact that w that record and other records are disappearing from the public archive, those are not your records to throw away. You know, you are obligated to maintain and preserve those records. And the only way that records are allowed to be destroyed is through an approved public records retention schedule by the state archivist. That hasn't happened. So, uh, Correspondence with the 911 board related to Montpelier ceasing to be a public safety answering point when we used to answer 911 calls here directly, which is a revenue implication in the crisis that we're in right now, subject of meetings today, et cetera. 
So how the correspondence related to Montpelier ceasing to be a PSAP disappears is troubling. You know, what? whose job is it to make sure that these records are found, preserved, located, and produced upon request? I would say it's the city manager's job, it is the city council's job to find out what, get to the bottom of this. Why are we losing public records? That's not allowed, it's illegal. Um, a request for records related to the veracity, complaints related to the veracity or professionalism of, of the police chief. Uh, that was characterized by, I, basically it's an attempt to cover it up. You know, they, they don't want a particular record or several records co exposing police chief's behavior to be made public. So they basically say, oh, there's too many. I'm like, oh, really? That's a whole other problem. If there's so many records related to the veracity or the professionalism of the police chief, you know, maybe that's news. But to have the city manager, you know, tell the reporter, Linda Berger, that a, a massive public records request, that shouldn't be a massive public records request. That should just be, what do you got on Chief Pete and whether he's been unprofessional or not, you know? So that one, th these have not been honored. The memo, Frazier, Frazier cannot be the head of the agency addressing his own appeal. So I asked for the memo that he provided to the council as support for him being allowed to modify his own contract without a lawyer representing the city, without a lawyer representing him. That is grossly unethical from everyone I've talked to. And, and Jack, you should know that of, of all things. And then to act as an appeal to the head of the agency for that memo and he doesn't see a conflict and have to hand that off to somebody else is absurd. So that memo, I don't believe is exempt after the contract is signed, you know? So, I mean, this stuff is piling up and the fact that I'm bringing it to your attention, y'all need to probably, it's more complex than you're gonna solve tonight but you need to take it seriously. You might need to appoint, I might suggest uh, soliciting some interested, honest public members to put work on a committee to catalog and address these issues. Uh, you know, Kelman, Kim Cheney, somebody who's basically not afraid of y'all, you know, or not beholden to you. You know, don't stack it like you did the, you know, homelessness task force with people who will maintain the status quo. Cruiser video. There's an incident where an officer gave false information related to a state law related to, you know, laying in a car and the incident report says the video is there, but then the video is missing. So we have people in positions of power in the law enforcement community with access and motive to destroy public records that would implicate them and potentially get a Brady letter, and we're allowing this to happen? Uh, I asked for, there should have been cruiser video of incident related to my putting the toilet signs in because the chief and another officer arrived just as I went to the police station to complain. Um, there's no video of that either. Um, I asked for the video of another person that I witnessed being harassed down in the Haney lot. And speaking of veracity, I, I was here the night that the vendor, the police chief couldn't adequately describe the body camera solution he wanted. So he very unusually brought a vendor in here to sit here and try to sell you his solution of the smartphone body cameras. And they then issued an RFP, and at, as that RFP was being mentioned, I spoke, and the council was reassured by the city manager, oh, they'll, this is just in the RFP. There will be for future opportunity to discuss the shortcomings of this solution after the RFP responses come in. And, and sure enough, true to form, it goes on the consent agenda to buy that solution, no discussion. And no, none of y'all had the guts to remove it from the consent agenda and discuss it. And those body cam and their shortcomings, those smartphone and their shortcomings 
are right in the center of this issue of me being assaulted by your police chief here in the hallway after being, you know, illegally arrested by your colleague. So access, and ins access to an inspection of records, especially the videos. Everyone seems to be being weaselly about who owns the videos that we, that come from these cameras. That, that uh, it's true an ORCA staff person sometimes, most of the time, operates the camera, but those videos are relied upon by our city clerk to complete the minutes. They are a public record. They're created in the course of agency business, and those belong to the city, and they should remain in the city's custody and control. And they're not. And I asked for the videos of all the Zoom meetings that we've held since the pandemic. And what did I get, a $3,800 estimate from Cameron? Some outrageous estimate of records that should be on a hard drive here that I could inspect them with or without closed captioning and take a copy with me on a thumb drive. This is not rocket science. This is sloppy management. And, and I'm calling it to your attention because you need to do something about it before it has to go to court. So I asked for records most recently about a person, uh, a NECI employee, who was reported to be he was a resident assistant in the dorms, and he was reported to be discovered in people's rooms when they woke up. And it raised alarms. And subsequent to that time, we learned that person was convicted and jailed for molesting a young a daughter of, of a, well, engaging in, I'm not, I won't, I, I don't have enough of the facts. But I've asked for the facts of what our police department knew and what interactions they had, and I'm told that $480. So what you've done by adopting that policy, remember I told you you shouldn't adopt this thing tonight on no public notice. You should handle it like an ordinance, hold public hearings, inform the public that their rights to get public records are going to be impinged by this, and you all just slammed it on through just to, you know, try to call it the, you know, Whitaker suppression uh, policy. Uh, so apparently from what I'm learning from Nordenson is that we changed from crime track software management system about 2013 to Valcor. Valcor is the current records management system. And he quoted $480 to do a search of one person's name in crime track. They still maintain the other system because they need it. There's no, they didn't migrate the records. So they're basically either, again, trying to cover up the fact that they failed to pursue this guy. Oh, this guy since went to prison and from something I read on the web, I can't, haven't verified, committed suicide after he was being investigated for the disappearance of the mother of the child that he molested. So this guy may have been a murderer, may have been a molester, and he's walking into people's rooms while they sleep here in Montpelier, and it's getting reported but not hitting the press. There's a problem with that. And it's, I've reported, I told you at, at another meeting, I reported theft of property that was mine, given to me by M&M, by Officer Long, and then I went to the internal affairs officer, and then I later asked him what was going on. He said, well, I wasn't going to rock the boat. I'm about to retire. So this is the kind of corruption that I raised with your police review committee, and they told, because of the narrow mission that you gave them for the police review committee, we're not going to look backwards. We're only going to dream about what would be nice in the future. But until you get accountability, until you acknowledge the mistakes that have been made and the injustices, you don't move on. You've got a corrupt department. The corrupt department harassing this guy sleeping in his car down <coughs> in the Haney lot, and you're throwing a paywall obstacle to getting the records of what was said. He l at least knew his rights well enough to not, you know, be pushed around and not volunteer information that they would distort and use against him. Um, so the only way that the city can rely on ORCA for maintain, maintenance 
and distribution and honoring public records requests for the videos of these meetings is if the city were under contract with ORCA, paying for the service and having ORCA agree to maintain the storage, maintain a safety storage, possibly in the cloud, and produce the records at the cost of duplication upon request and in accordance with public records law. We don't have that. And I asked for those contracts. We don't have that contract. So we cannot be relying on the fact that in CVPSA does the same thing. You know, Donna refuses to record CVPSA meetings because she says Orca's doing it for us. And I don't want to, she even says on the record, I don't want to have those records because then I'm responsible for maintaining them and distributing them. Well, that's, we're not CVPSA. But we are a member of CVPSA. So you have an obligation through your assigned representatives to that council to hold that council accountable. With all due respect. So I asked for body cam footage uh, and this relates to the same with the CAD system. Before a cat, that we should have switched CAD systems, an analysis should have been done of what impact is this going to have on public records access. Is this going to create a financial burden for requesters if we move into a new system without migrating the records? That should have been asked with the CAD system. It should have been asked with the body cams. I asked for body cam footage, and they say we don't, we're, they're telling me they're not obliged to give me a copy. And I'm saying, you're damn right you're obliged to give me a copy. That's what the state law says. The requester can request to inspect or receive a copy. A copy is not a link. When I tried to download this thing from whatever site, some third-party site out there, which is a risk to even click on links at third-party sites, it crashed the tablet I was using. And Fraser says, oh, it works on my tablet. That's all. We don't, we don't have the records here, so we're not obliged to produce them. Oh, because we've stored the records at the vendor site, we're claiming we're not, those aren't public records anymore. We're not bound by the re requirement to produce a copy of a record. That's freaking twisted logic. So this is the kind of flying in the face of law that happens at the discretion of the manager. And I didn't suggest contract out for an attorney because an attorney, a contracted attorney, has an incentive to lead you into litigation, which then he gets quite profit from. So I said the city should have an attorney that reviews many of Bill Frazier's actions and stops him before he crosses over the line, which he does all too frequently. So a, ca a city of this size, a capital city, should have a city attorney. So I don't know what you want to do with all that. Uh, okay, yeah. I'm going to ask, ask you to wrap up. Yeah, it, it seems like you're getting close to the end, and I'd like to... Oh, and I didn't so even we, take half the time that the tree board take, took. So, so. We, so we can have uh, some opportunity for So the person's name is Fernando Asturizaga, and, and you should be concerned with that. I mean, there could be other victims in our community who have learned. And I've talked to people on the street, both housed and unhoused, and they refuse to report. They are disinclined to report when somebody steals their phone or assaults them because they don't trust our police department. And, and I can see why. If our police department steals from me, assaults me, you know, disappears records, and is learned from this council and prior that it, they do that with impunity, you know, what kind of example are you setting that this is a town that we want to, that we live in, or that we don't need a police oversight body with subpoena authority to investigate that? Because that body that body would have the guts to do what y'all don't do, which is your obligation. So that's most of my notes that came to mind. There are other examples, but that's enough for you to get started on and realize the magnitude of this issue. Okay, thank you. Any questions from mem any members of the council? Okay, I, I will just make an observation um, or I take it that uh, although I, I know you've litigated some issues about public records or open meetings in, in court before, I take it that you've not uh, sued the city for any of the violations that you claim 
uh, we've res re we're responsible for uh, on these cases? Correct. Okay. And uh, <coughs> I will not hope that y'all will do your job. And my, my observation is that uh, there's a tremendous amount of what I would uh, characterize as begging the question by you here. And, uh, and by that I mean that uh, you've referred uh, on a number of occasions in your testimony to um, records that uh, were not given to you that you believe because of some rumor that you've heard from somebody that those records exist, but you do not actually have any evidence that those records uh, ever existed. For instance, the uh, uh, for instance the uh, permit conditions at uh, the city center building. They were reported that, uh, in the press. And it, that you apparently have heard rumors. A couple of, you said that a couple of people have told you that those uh, conditions existed. I know that you've been offered the opportunity to go through whatever records exist in the uh, in storage to see if you can find what. Uh, what it's not my obligation for. to find records. It's the city's obligation to produce them. That's a very important only point. They, only if they exist. Only if they yes, exist. Yes, but if they exist, it is the city's obligation to be able to locate them in a time-efficient manner. A, a sloppy file system is not supported by case law to be grounds for charging fees. Well, you're assuming that they exist. Um, they, they, why wouldn't the city manager certify they don't exist? Because he now, knew he, they, he destroyed them? Now, is there... Uh, and, and uh, you're undoubtedly aware that the uh, city center building was uh, was not done during the tenure of the current city manager. Yes. Um, does anyone else have uh, any uh, comments or questions to the uh, witness or any uh, action they want to propose the city take in response to what we've been presented tonight? Okay. We'll move on to the next agenda item. Thank you. <laughs> Classic. Next. I hope the voters hold y'all accountable. Next item on the agenda is uh, the request from uh, Councillor Bate about the CVPSA. Uh, thank you. Uh, Central Vermont Public Safety Authority is holding its public hearing on a proposed three-year budget tomorrow night, uh, November 10th. And the initial draft can change radically. We, they're going to be making a decision right prior to the public hearing. They're having a regular board meeting to discuss the budget. When we left October meeting, they were talking about putting enough money in the budget to hire an executive director. And even if we did it as a contract and not an employee, as an employee, it was costing us part-time over $100,000. <laughs> And we, that also included a very small single room we rented uh, with a phone. So but with a subcontractor instead of an employee, we got the cost down to around $70,000. But then they also talked about a CAD, which also um, Stevens mentioned a couple times. And, and what a CAD, does that stand for? A CAD is a computer-aided dispatch system. And it means you not only, in one communication channel, you have your staff, you have pictures of where your vehicles are. It's very holistic, comprehensive for the dispatcher to have a handle on everybody through one channel as well as everybody else knows where things are going on. Instead of right now, people are on, are on, have to come in at different times. Information is not readily available. And it's very expensive. Uh, Televate, when they did our need assessment, report that came out in August in 2021 estimated the cost for Barry and Montpelier to have a CAD system was around $750,000. Now, uh, Joe's Ellsworth at Barry said there's some other ways of getting a CAD system that's less costly, but it's a major capital um, venture. And so for this year, the proposal is to put a consultant fee in to work on the CAD system, to work on what would work and, and how, uh, do like an RFP for equipment, just we call it brush out that approach. And so with that, we would be putting into the ballot for March uh, somewhere between a $100,000, $150,000 request. 
Now just, it is just for Montpelier, and then no, for both cities. Both, okay, <coughs> for both cities. So <laughs> if it was a uh, hundred hundred thousand dollars, then it would be fifty three thousand dollars on from Barry and forty seven thousand dollars from Montpelier, and. So the board has requested that, and so the draft budget includes that option. And I think during the discussion whether or not they stay on wanting to have an executive director, uh, I think with the price of the CAD, it's likely to be put off, but I think they would want to have some consultant on board, because the one thing the Public Safety Authority has done well is both training for dispatchers and equipment. And so I think that they would want to be putting that out there, whether it's the next year, like right now, it would be FY 25, 26. But anyway, that's what they were looking at down the road. And so my request is I want to pause from the council. And I also think perhaps that at some point, the council needs to talk to your own representatives on the Public Safety Authority about what you want them to do and what you see the role of Public Safety Authority in the near. And this is a three-year budget, so just in the next three years, what you see that role to be. I just didn't want to keep the Public Safety Authority Board in a vacuum. We just haven't heard from the councils. Mm -hmm. And what do you think we should do? <laughs> I don't want to spend money on an executive director. Uh, we had one, and Paco was wonderful, very experienced, but the councils proved to us again and again they really weren't ready to succeed any kind of authority. And so I think that we could possibly do some sort of an administrative staff would be nice but not an executive director quality, a public safety expert. Uh, and that we would work on training and hopefully develop the board to be stronger and that the commitment of Barry Montpelier is either stronger or we don't keep the public safety authority. I think, it, it's, again, it's at the point we have to make those decisions. But right now I'm just dealing with the, the budget primarily. There, there was a definite cr crisis, I would say, with the public safety authority uh, in that today I attended a hearing at the Joint Financial Committee at the State House, and within that was the response is what was going to happen with this application that Montpelier did. Uh, the one that we finally put in for $3.5 million for all this equipment that came out of the needs assessment, for the towers, for all the upgrade of 1990s equipment that's sitting out there in the field <laughs> that all of our FAR and all of our EMS depend on, desperately needs to be replaced. And we reduced that request to uh, 2.444, and we thought that the Public Safety Authority Department of the state was in agreement with that 2.44 request in this application. But in the hearing today, I very clearly heard the commissioner not yet ready. Yes, they are accepting the application. It has been approved, but it's been put off at least for next year. And they were... Uh, the department was awarded money to bring in their own expert to help them evaluate applications like came from Montpelier because they feel their own staff doesn't understand the equipment. And so they're going to try to better assess all the applications. They're right now, and we're authorized today through the Joint Committee, to give money out to five different citizens, uh, five different, um, let's see, I, I probably have that, a copy of that. Um, five different agencies, and those five agencies, a Montpelier is like number six, <laughs> so we're in the phase one that would be next year, not this year. Uh, in that initial phase, it's a much smaller request from each place. Uh, Chittenden County that originally asked for a lot more is getting uh, a, a smaller amount uh, to, help, to help their process. Uh, Hartford, St. J., much, most of them are like 200,000, 300,000, 500,000. Um, and they're doing that because their PSAPs, which is the statewide 911 number, and all the free dispatching those PSAPs do for those 81 communities that get free public safety dispatching, they're wanting to take them out of the state dispatchers and put them into these regional systems. So if you were in a regional system, that would help reduce the PSAP's volume of calls because the state can't handle them. They don't have enough coverage of their dispatch jobs in Williston and in Westminster to cover all the calls that are coming in from the towns they're doing free dispatching for. So their priority this year is to fund those dispatch centers 
who put an application in that will serve their overload. So literally they're shifting their dispatch calls onto these regional systems and are only funding the regional systems that are helping them out. And I thought I, I think I recall that uh, there was, there's been dis discussion that this free dis dispatch system is essentially going to go away. That, yes, and that's part of having the regional, statewide regional uh, dispatch centers is that they're finally seeing that. But it's also because they're seeing a need that they can no longer do it. They mm -hmm. literally don't have the staffing. It's just been overwhelming the volume. And no town would pay if they could get it for free. So. Right. <laughs> right. And so, but, so everybody <laughs> is now going to be have to be paid. And that's a shock <laughs> to everybody's system. But the legislators, as well as the Department of Public Safety, are admitting that they themselves need a lot of education. And when you start talking equipment and towers and communication and, and the expense of that, they're overwhelmed. And so they feel they do need to educate themselves. They do need to bring in consultants to help them assess all the applications. And it's interesting because they had a scope of work criteria on the applications that went into the department, of which Montpelier was one that put it in, and they were all graded, and Montpelier was graded 75, which came out fifth place, but because Montpelier was a much higher need and doesn't displace as much volume in their PSAP, it was moved to a phase one. Hmm. Yeah. Is that, I, 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 this is a lot of information. No, this is, this is helpful. And, and okay. It's it making sense to you. I don't want to yeah. anybody else, but you well, can ask me. Well, other, other people will have a chance to ask questions, okay. too. It's, it sounds... Are, so if the other uh, agencies are all looking for on the level of a couple of hundred thousand, we're asking for two and a half million, that's because we're, we're way ahead of them in the process. They're still looking to study, yes. and we're ready to, uh, right. to buy and install. Is right. that right? And I believe, I don't know with the Chittenden County, but I believe we're the only one that has done a full need assessment mm -hmm. of our region. Uh, Chittenden County might be closer to 700,000. I, I can pull up the numbers if anybody wants them. Uh, there's a link through the State House. I realize I didn't have a printed of that. But, okay. uh, yeah, some good information that was given uh, to the Joint Committee today that was helpful. Anyone else? have questions I want to raise? Um, this isn't really a question. It's just as you're, as you're thinking about this budget development, um, you mentioned the possibility of bringing in a contractor to work as a staff member, to work as an executive director, or an, uh, possibly the administrative person. I would just, I would just caution the, the authority against that um, because there are pretty, pretty restrictive laws about um, when you can hire a contractor and when it needs to be an employee. And I don't think an executive director could ever not be an employee. So that might not be a hmm. cost-saving measure that's available. That's what I, I'm, I, I'm just suggesting. That's a great point. Yeah. I haven't researched. I was, yeah. Again, I'm not in favor of putting money into right. staff. <laughs> but uh, that's a great point. I will d I'll definitely tell the board in between now and tomorrow. I will investigate that. Thank you. But it, it seems like year after year we're in the same position of deciding are we going to stay in the authority or completely pull the plug i know you keep hovering on the pond you know get your toes wet but you haven't jumped in uh -huh. but you haven't jumped out so what do you want folks uh -huh. <laughs> i'm so, you know guidance no. please bill do you have any expertise that you can shed on this or, or no uh, knowledge, whether yeah, it's I think expertise. Donna's analysis of the description uh, of the situation is correct. Um, I was just looking at the, uh, the awards. One of them was to Colchester, which is the Chittenden County um, Regional, and there's, their original request for, was for 2.865, and it got reduced down to 757. So it wasn't that everyone was asking right. for smaller amounts. Uh, we, our original was 3.5, which got reduced to 2.4. Also concerning that, you know, in the conversation, um, members of the Joint Fiscal did suggest, that, said that they had been hearing from people about Montpelier's application, and that raised concern. So that, that bothered me. Um, but, you know, certainly we have a public document uh, that their experts are welcome to go over. If they want to go over what our experts went over, that's fine. With regard to the CVPSA uh, budget, I mean, that's, I think the question maybe that's on the table is, I mean, obviously this council can't direct anybody 
to do anything. They're a separate agency, as we've stated many times. Uh, but whether we wanted to give any direction to our our two appointed reps, um, you know, my question when I saw it was, what's an executive director going to do? I don't, not against an executive director, but there, there's no agency to run. There's no employees. There's no anything. I mean, so I think it would be good to know what what was what both communities are, are paying for. And so my suggestion is that we invite CVPSA in um, to our December 14 meeting, which is when we'll be talking about our budget anyway, and have them explain what they're proposing and why and what we're getting from it. And that way we can hear from everybody and have a conversation where everyone can hear the information at the same time. I think City of Barrie is considering doing the same thing and inviting them in at their meeting on the 13th of December, so they'd be back-to-back -back nights. Sound like a plan? Uh, yes, and in fact, uh, the Public Safety Authority's annual meeting, which is required by its charter to follow so long after its public hearing on the budget, mm -hmm. is December 19th. So the 14th and 13th would work very well into that. You'd have a lot of in interaction between the two, three groups. That would be great. Anyone have any other thoughts about this? Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve Whitaker again. The, uh, you heard about records requests relating that implicate this. Uh, those spreadsheets that Motorola provided, um, even without the missing numbers that appear on tab one. There's over a million dollars of unfunded in that in that proposal from Motorola in the way of support, network, uh, network management, engineering. This system has never been engineered. In fact, experts have told me that we should scrap the simulcast design that we applied for due to lack of scarcity of frequencies and difficulty in getting new frequencies and design a trunk radio system which allows multiple incidents to operate in different talk groups so they're not hearing each other's traffic. You can have a structure fire in Barry and a car roll over in Northfield and all of the dispatch messages to each of those goes to them alone on a trunk system. And because it's so difficult, we're above the A line, meaning getting new frequencies to expand a regional dispatch capacity uh, requires sometimes years of work back and forth with Canada uh, because of the radio interference problems. So um, so to have sh the, oh, the other reason that Montpelier was not awarded in this is the, is the governance. The governance requirements of the RFP were representative governance by the served agents by the serve municipalities and there's no way that even even Brian Pete has mentioned in several meetings that CVPSA may be the solution to that in that it is structured by charter oh by the way the charter requires an executive director it requires an annual audit this chair of has decided to ignore the charter uh, and we're so glad that she'll be uh, term limited out next March so we may actually get, uh, with Doug Hoyt and Donna off the board, we may actually start to see a footing and new towns joining and quit dragging anchor. There's a conflict of interest here. I've raised it before. Montpelier generates $400,000 plus in revenue by having a monopoly dispatch center. A regional authority might choose to contract with Montpelier for another couple of years while they get set up but might logically choose to create a <coughs> regional dispatch center up in Berlin, for instance. Okay, let, let me ask you a question. Uh, was the information, up, up, I assume that you've reviewed the uh, report of the Televate study? I did. Uh, was the information about this trunk radio system that, uh, that you uh, talked about, was that <coughs> available to Televate when they did their study and report? They know about Trunks Radio, but what they did is they basically adopted work that some of the departments had already invested in. There had already been a proposal from Motorola years ago for a million and a half or two million, 
million and three quarters. And that was later underbid by half by a uh, vendor for different equipment. Uh, I don't think that applies here. Um, so they basically took a pre-sketched design and decided to run with it. They never did any engineering. They didn't analyze. I bet they'll tell you that trunk radio has its advantages, but they didn't, they didn't uh, do the work. They didn't do a lot of the work. They didn't assess the structural capacity of the towers, the electrical grounding of the towers. You know, they shortchanged us a lot, and that's under Donna's watch. Uh, she loves Televate, and I pointed out, and you all have seen my analysis of their the shortcomings of their report. Okay. So the uh, 2.4 million cut grant, because engineering's not allowed, from the 3.6 that we asked for, plus the other million and a half that is in the Motorola proposal that isn't funded anywhere, starts to make this look like a very precarious and even deceptive. Also, the Montpelier application represents that Northfield is joining in, and Northfield's not joining in as a police department. So, you know, there's, a, there's almost fraud going on. Once you're made aware of that, you don't correct your proposal and say, we no longer have Northfield on board. That's looking like fraud. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chief Pete. Good Thank evening, you. sir. Good evening, members of the uh, city council, city manager, assistant city manager, Brian Pete with the Montpelier Police Department. Uh, I, I'll just make it brief. Uh, there are a host of reasons. And, and the context to which my recommendation of a governance model, um, that CVPSA is that governance model, uh, there's a context there. And, and, my, and, and, and so since he brought it up, I said, yeah, it, CVPSA could be a governance model, but in the current form, it's dysfunctional and it doesn't work. It would have to be changed to be a, a governance model. Um, and, and, and long story short, the biggest risk to the money that we're getting, that we're looking for right now, is in fact attributed to certain members within this organization, because they're bringing, they're muddying the waters. The same folks who are, advert, who are who advocated for us to, to get this, this, uh, this communications infrastructure done, are now actively pushing members of the legislature to deny the this the very grant that we need so 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 there's there's a lot of moving parts and muddiness and and, and the context is being twisted and consorted to, to meet a certain agenda uh, depending on who you ask um, the the governance model that that is not why we are, are not are looking at it the governance model for any of them none of that's been decided I'm on the working group for the communications uh, plan as, a, as, as appointed by the, uh, the governor and legislation, that's not true. So, uh, so all I'll just will, will caution is next month, there, there can be some serious questions asked, but if, if there's any jeopardy to funding, we're shooting ourselves in the foot because we have individuals who are going to members of the legislation saying that Montpelier is not ready to have this grant. Thank you, any, any questions for the chief? Okay. <clears throat> well, um, we're we're to council discussion now. Can I can I clarify? I, yeah, I don't want to counter most of the things that Stephen has said about public safety authority, but I I would like to make the statement clear that Kim Cheney was chair for two years. The first two years that we lost our executive director and lived without our executive director, and Kim Cheney was chair during the year of which we initiated the need assessment and its scope of work. And I became chair the last two years to try to implement it and get money for it. So I just wanted to clarify that. Thank Thanks. You. And so, <coughs> so to clarify where we are right now, well, well, I have another question that you may know, or Bill, you may know, and that is, do we have the authority, as a council, do we have the authority to direct uh, our representatives how to vote on stuff like we, this? We've done it in the past. <laughs> When I was a city appointed one, Tom and I both were directed by council. Okay, so we think we do. Mm -hmm. And so what we have a pro, the plan that you're proposing is one, we should uh, invite the authority to our meeting on the, uh, on the 14th. And is there anything else you'd like from us tonight? Just really think about what you feel its role can be and if it can be useful. 
but it's not something something we have to do and decide tonight. No. Okay. Anything else we should talk about? Uh, you don't need a vote to nope. ask them to come in. Okay. Well, thanks, Donna. I I rely on your uh, expertise and your years of uh, devotion to this issue uh, as I think about these things. Thank you. All right. I think we're up to uh, item number 10, a uh, proposal for a Do you want to go to all the others and then just end with the executive session? Oh, yeah, we should do that. That's typically what we do. Yep. Uh, we have other business. Is there any other business that we haven't taken up? Um, we're at a council reports. We'll start at this end. <laughs> Laura. You got her unprepared. <laughs> <laughs> um, not much tonight. Um, the only things I wanted to say were uh, working at the polls. It was great to see such great turnout. Thank you to the city clerk and team for a really impressive operation with, as we still are, um, with mail-in ballots and all that, working out new systems. So it was great to see, and hopefully we can get John home soon <laughs> to rest. Um, but that is great, and I know we'll have lots more time to celebrate Chief <coughs> Pete, but also just wanted to um, haven't had a chance yet to express my gratitude. We'll uh, miss you. It's really been a privilege to work with you. And as someone who served on the police review committee, I was so grateful for the just the um, proactive, positive um, approach you took to um, you know looking at our community and really looking at how we can have the best possible police department and. What uh, you know, I was just really impressed over and over again with how we were able to have productive conversations and build on a lot of you know amazing strengths of the department and look for how we can continue to make it better and a lot of the work to kind of institutionalize a lot of the practices that the department had and leaving it in even better shape than you found it. And we'll miss you and wish you a lot of luck in your next. But just wanted to thank you because it, it's really been a pleasure to work with you. That's it. I don't have anything other than um, also for Chief Pete. Um, I actually have a gift here for you tonight. I was hoping you would be here in person, and I've been to the station looking for you too. So I have to see you soon um, before you leave. But I I wanted to publicly thank you for um, taking a Los Angeles girl who has a very difficult and challenging relationship with the police department and um, making that not a thing anymore. And um, I really appreciate you, and I appreciate your presence in the community, and I'm going to miss you. Um, so thank you for that gift and just for welcoming me onto city council in such a good way. So I have something for you, but I'll give it to you at another time. So that's all. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll go now. I'll, I'll, I'll pile on the chief and say <laughs> that <coughs> how much I appreciate the, everything you've done, and it's... Uh, you, you came in at a difficult time, and uh, you, you were immediately confronted with having to have deal with this uh, police review committee, and it's, uh, that had the potential for being a very uh, challenging activity. And in many ways, it was a challenging activity, but the fact that you were very open and welcoming of, uh, of this community effort to scrutinize and question and examine what the police department does in a goal in an uh, effort to make sure it was better and uh, and serves a community as well as it possibly could was i would say exactly what uh, we needed in a chief and i'm i'll, I'll be very sorry to see you go um, i would also want to say that uh, Again, it was great do, working out at the polls uh, yesterday. I, I had one, one of the things that I always enjoy is at the polls and I'm check, checking in voters is uh, when I get to meet voters who are coming to vote for the first time, They're either young people who've just turned 18, had a couple of them, or people who are adults who've been 
living here all their life and for some reason they decide, well, finally I'm going to get out and vote for the first time. And we even ha I even met one person who was a brand new citizen who was voting for the first time. And so it, it's inspiring every time I do it. Um, thank you to every, the, every one of the candidates who, uh, who ran uh, successfully or unsuccessfully. It, it takes something to put yourself out there and you don't, don't know if you're gonna win or not. And uh, so, that, but that's what, what keeps our uh, democracy going. And that's all I've got. On the uh, Chief Pete uh, train here, <laughs> and uh, you know, just 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 say, Chief, I, I think you, you came in at a time when, you know, it was a difficult time for law enforcement in America, and it still is in many ways. But the, the way you put yourself out there, I remember like the first time meeting you, and just sort of a crowd gathering around you, and uh, just just having the difficult conversations when it was needed. And bringing a level of like innovation and community mindedness to this job, um, and, and really leaving the place, you know, bit better than how you found it. And uh, I, I don't think we could ask anything more. We probably terrorized you quite a bit on council here, uh, but your professionalism was like <coughs> without a doubt there. And I, I think what really spoke to me was talking to uh, different officers on the force here, and, and just the way they spoke about you, Chief. And um, I, I think that's a real testament to yourself. And I said it to a reporter, but the fact that you were willing to just pick up a patrol shift, you know, um, that there was never any, like, you know, I management, you know, your staff or anything. You, you rolled up your sleeves and you did a job. So I, I think the department you're going to is very uh, lucky to have you, and it, it's certainly our loss. It's going to be big shoes to fill. So thanks so much, Chief. Um, uh, as far as the election, I, you know, <laughs> very tired. I only had one Red Bull. It's, uh, I could have used a couple. Uh, obviously, want to thank all the voters who came out. Um, you know, it's been a long haul running since uh, May here, and uh, you know, I knocked three thousand five hundred doors, and I think I really gained a different perspective in many areas of this community here, and learned a lot. And um, you know, hope to take that with me. Um, I really want to, you know, call out Donna, um, who's been a mentor since I've gone on council five years ago, and uh, you've taught me a tremendous amount. I, I remember Donna was like, uh, get, well, you know about labor, you don't talk about anything else. And, uh, you know, <laughs> and that was kind of true, but like I learned a lot, by, you know, and a lot of that was just sitting next to you. And, uh, you, know, you know, it, it was such a, uh, I, I never considered you an opponent. It was a, an incredibly respectful, you know. Um, a, a competitive race, and uh, you know, I, I think we were all better for for it at the end of the day. But I think the world of Yadana, uh, as well as uh, the, the other folks who were in the race there, uh, Jean Leon, uh, Glennie Sewell, and Kate McCann, who will be serving uh, with me. Uh, <clears throat> but I do want to say, uh, Peter Kalman mentioned at the beginning of it. I uh, I think if my term had gone until maybe this March, I may have stuck it out, but I, I will be stepping down from council. And I, I think I want to take, you know, it's just been 24 hours, I'd like to take the week to talk to my colleague, city staff here, and try to figure out a time to do it with the least disruption there. Um, I know we have budget coming up and everything, so just want to do what's best for the town here. Um, but obviously, I'll be serving the town in a different capacity. Um, uh, city government issues are very close to my heart after going through everything we've gone through together. Uh, I'd love to stay on the lobbying committee on some capacity. I'd love to stay... Uh, I'm a non-voting member anyways on the Homelessness Task Force, and, and see what trees we can shake to get the resources we need to do some of these jobs uh, at the state level. But um, I, I really want to say all of you, I've, you know, I, I, again, you're uh, an inspiration to me, and uh, all I've learned, you know, on the campaign trail and with you, I uh, hope to take that wisdom uh, up to the state house, as they probably throw me on fish and wildlife and I can't do anything. But, it's, uh, <laughs> oh, <you laughs> something, <Tom. laughs> but congratulations to the mayor as well, and uh, onward. Thanks so much. Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to um, join in on the, the congratulations and thanks to Chief Pete. Um, I have, you know, I'm the newest member of city council, and I have just been consistently impressed with your dedication to the town and, and with your dedication to service and also with your willingness to use words like love when you're talking about police work and law enforcement. And um, 
I just don't know that we're ever gonna we're never gonna find quite the the combination of of strengths that we have in you. So I, I will greatly miss you. I appreciate your work so much. Um, I know it's been really challenging all the way around, and I appreciate you kind of hanging in there with us. And um, wish you all the best in in your next your next steps. And I also want to congratulate everyone who who won their elections and also to those who ran in elections. As um, Jack had said, it is something to put yourself out there. It really is. Um, so I, I was actually reelected Justice of the Peace. So thanks to people who <laughs> voted for me for that. Um, You're I, welcome. <laughs> you filed your campaign finance forms for that? Yeah. <laughs> It, it, this, so this is a job I've been doing for I think about 20 years now, and I have loved, 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 loved it. And it's it was um, a big part of kind of prepping me to want to serve on the city council and to understand a little bit about how all that worked. And um, we did not have 15 people running on the ballot this year for Justice of the Peace. However, we had a very strong showing of write-in candidates, and we had people who were running writing campaigns. So I particularly want to congratulate Morgan Brown and Rosie Kruger and Mark Leopold, who won write-in campaigns and will now be joining us as uh, justices of the peace. And I w I'm hoping that this means two years from now, there will be a little bit more kind of a, a s excitement generated around <laughs> running for justice of the peace. And we'll have <laughs> lots and lots of people who want to do it and will, um, uh, talk to the the party the the party committees of um of our town the progressive committee and the republican committee and the democratic committee it's not the the only way to get elected obviously but it's a good way to get on the ballot um so that's all i have thanks <laughs> yeah, jack jack thought it was going to be a short meeting <laughs> <laughs> <That's> <laughs> uh so uh pete chief uh yeah. <laughs> See, I do Connor and Casey the same way. I'm calling him Casey the first name part of the time. Um, but anyway, Chief Pete, uh, much appreciated. And I'll ditto whatever everyone else has said, but also to add my experience with you dealing with the Public Safety Authority, and particularly this last application to the Department of uh, Public Safety. Uh, you've really been pivotal. You've really jumped in, and something that's got a lot of history, and you've just joined at, at a higher level and helped everybody. So I do appreciate that. And I appreciate your family going through another move. Uh, whatever the, the positives are, it's still stressful. So give yourself more time as you go and settle out. And likewise, uh, just wish you well, wish you well. And, like, and I want to mention John and all the other people who helped volunteer for the election. It's always a lot of work and a lot of worry and <laughs> he hasn't fallen asleep here, <laughs> but I know he wants to. <laughs> but but thank you, and really appreciate all the voters coming out. Uh, it wasn't as large a turnout as we expected, but it was a good turnout. And as far as being a candidate in a general election, I do feel like we're too partisan. I really feel the two parties have a strong hold because there was very little activity. There were no paper interviews, paper articles once the primaries were over, and I think that's a weakness. Uh, but then that's my bias. But I know that Connor and Kate will do a good job. They definitely ran an excellent campaign. Uh, after all, he used to be <laughs> managing everybody else's campaign. You learned something, huh? <laughs> and, and and so it means the council have a, has a lot of big uh, things happening in the future and so people out there should be thinking about do you want to run for council and really think about the issues and start showing up whether it's and it's not just the council meetings you should go to a committee meeting I went to so many committee meetings before I went to council and it really helps you and grounds you in what are your priorities so the challenge is out there for all the voters, and I'm still challenging voters to call the state about housing, that we really need the state to be the leaders. They have the authority. I call it one senator in an article said the state has the money and the muscle to do housing. Municipals can help. But they've got to have leadership, and they won't until voters put the pressure on. So use your voices and call the state. They need to deal with homeless as if it was a big flood and make people get housed. Thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, city clerk's report. Uh, I want to thank
thank all the volunteers, some of whom are right here, uh, for all the help the other day. Um, and thanks to everyone who came out to vote. Thanks to all the candidates for running. Uh, we had almost exactly the same number of voters. It was like 30 some, I think, from the last midterm election four years ago, which is um, almost spookily consistent. But um, yeah, anyways, thanks. Thanks for all the kind words. And city manager's report. Just a couple things. Um, also, <coughs> thank everyone involved with the election, candidates and poll workers and the clerk and uh, everybody. Um, we are fortunate here in Vermont and Montpelier to have these things run smoothly and civilly. Um, and uh, it's a, it's, it is really a, a nice thing. I certainly would add my praise to Chief Pete, but we'll probably be doing more of that later. But I, appreciate, I, I know he appreciates the kind words that, that you all said. Uh, we mentioned it earlier. I was going to uh, mention it tonight, but we did uh, formally uh, promote Kurt Modica to Public Works Director. So we're very excited about that, and Zach Blodgett to Deputy Public Works Director. So that they're, um, they, as a team, will be of excellent leadership at DPW. We're excited about that. Um, of course, we've already promoted Kelly to Assistant Manager. We are interviewing candidates for her well, still kind of present job and <laughs> former <laughs> job. She is doing double duty. I'm surprised she's still awake. Um, but uh, for finance director next Monday, we hope uh, that there's a, a top candidate in that group. And then uh, I am meeting with the police department members tomorrow to get their take on where th what they'd like to see for the future of the department to get that piece of input before make a conclusion on how to move forward on uh, filling those big shoes uh, at the police department. So that's what we're happening with, it, with our, our big positions. Um, got some great news during this meeting, actually, uh, that I found out uh, that uh, another way group has voted to operate uh, an overflow shelter at Christchurch this winter. So that's wonderful. Um, obviously, we uh, will provide them. And hats off to the Homelessness Task Force who helped push to make that happen and those members. Um, so that's great. That's that's uh, we've got a long way to go, but that's something that's desperately needed. Um, and let's see. Um, oh, this is a really minor thing, but in our budget schedule, we had left either January 25, which is a Wednesday, or January 26 is a Thursday as our last day. As you know, we've often done Thursday because that's a deadline for petitions but we didn't actually make a final decision. So any, any preference? Just because we got to start posting the schedule and all. I'd, I'd probably go with Thursday because then it's all it's wrapped tradition. up. Yep. OK, yep. fine. Then that's what we will do. 26th it is. And um, I believe that's it for me. OK. Um, and don't forget, we have one more topic. Right, we have one more topic. Um, item 10, a proposal for housing and conservation project. And this is a motion that we would probably go into executive session. Do we have a motion? I'll make a motion we go into executive session to discuss the potential development of purchasing a property. Pursuant to 1 VSA section 317 subjects in 13? Absolutely right. That's what I thought. <laughs> and we're having the manager and, uh, and Alec. And Alec and Kelly, if she'd like to join us. Um, OK. Is, is there a second? Second. And we're not expecting to take action afterward, are we? I don't think. No. So OK. We don't, we don't need to v come back out and vote. So that'll be the end of the meeting. OK. All those in th favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. We'll go into executive session.